and free on all platforms. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's a UFO. For the first time in more than 50 years, U.S. officials provided public testimony about their investigation of UFOs, or as they call them, unidentified aerial phenomena. Officials told lawmakers in the rare house hearing, we know service members have encountered them. You be the judge yourself. You are looking at videos shown at the hearing today. President Biden, the consoler in chief, visiting Buffalo to comfort the families of the victims of what he called a racist rampage and terrorism. Biden making it clear white supremacy has no place in America. In America, evil will not win, I promise you. Hate will not prevail. And white supremacy will not have the last word. The mayor of Buffalo is standing by to talk about what the president's visit means for his community. And we're tracking new developments into the investigation in Buffalo, what we're now learning about the suspect and the nearly 600-page hate-filled document posted online. Tonight, the scary developments for parents, two children hospitalized after they did not tolerate a switch from their normal Abbott formula. This is baby formula makers have been summoned to testify in Congress about the nationwide shortage. The chilling new headline involving that East China plane that crashed in March, is it possible someone in the cockpit nosedived the plane on purpose? Gio Benitez is standing by with the major developments. Amber Heard grilled once again during cross-examination. Depp's lawyers accuse her of altering her photos of bruises. We have all the bombshell moments from court today. And it is primary night. Five more states head to the polls. We got you covered with the nationwide implications. The key races to watch that will once again test the power of former President Trump's endorsement and the contest tonight that could go a long way to determining if Republicans can take control of the Senate this fall. I just cast a vote for myself, which is not a humble thing to do, but it's what I'm humbling asking all Pennsylvanians to do. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. In America, evil will not win. Hate will not prevail. Those words from the commander-in-chief turned consoler-in-chief in Buffalo today, visiting a grief-stricken community there. President Biden choking back tears while recalling one of the victims who went to the top supermarket Saturday simply to buy his son a birthday cake. Biden called the attack a racist rampage and terrorism. He recalled the rally in Charlottesville and the crowd there chanting, you will not replace us, and how that inspired him to get into the presidential race. Once again today, he vowed that white supremacy has no place in America. The president and first lady then met with community leaders and privately with victims' families and paid their respects at a memorial near the supermarket. This comes as we learn new details about the suspected shooter and how he allegedly planned the rampage, which the FBI is now investigating as a hate crime. We're standing by to speak with Buffalo's mayor, who was with the president today. But first, Mary Bruce, who's traveling with the president, leads us off. In Buffalo today, President Biden visiting the site of what he called a murderous racist rampage, spending over an hour and a half meeting with the families of the 10 people killed, emotionally remembering the victims one by one. Andre McNeil, 53, worked at a restaurant, went to buy his three-year-old son a birthday cake. His son selling a birthday, asking where's daddy. <clears throat> the president, blunt. What happened here is simple and straightforward. Terrorism. Terrorism. Domestic terrorism. Violence inflicted in the service of hate. The president calling out those who espouse replacement theory, the racist belief allegedly embraced by the shooting suspect that there is a conspiracy to replace white Americans with people of color. A hate that through the media and politics, the internet, has radicalized, angry, alienated, lost, and isolated individuals into falsely believing that they will be replaced. Biden assailing the politicians and members of the media who amplify the bigoted ideology. And I condemn those who spread the lie for power, political gain, and for profit. White supremacy is a poison. It's a poison <laughs> running through our, it really is. <laughs> running through our body politic. And it's been allowed to fester and grow right in front of our eyes. 
The president declaring this hate cannot be the story of our time. We have to refuse to live in a country where black people going about a weekly grocery shopping can be gunned down by weapons of war deployed in a racist cause. Our thanks to Mary Bruce for that. Now to the investigation and troubling new revelations from documents posted on social media and obtained by ABC News. ABC's Stephanie Ramos once again in Buffalo for us tonight. Tonight, as the president and first lady paid their respects to the 10 victims killed here in Buffalo, officials again calling the attack on a Topps supermarket premeditated evil. The level of hatred in the heart and head of this individual is, is stunning. This as more details emerge from a 589 page document containing posts the suspect allegedly wrote on the social media platform Discord. Authorities say the document shows how 18 year old Peyton Gendron carefully plotted the attack for several months, first visiting the grocery store on March 8th, where he was questioned by a store security guard. That document also including sketches of the supermarket with outlines of various aisles that he could navigate around quickly. The suspect also allegedly describing the market as the first location he would strike, then black people walking down the street and another store down the road. And tonight, that document also appearing to show that the 18-year-old took part in animal abuse. In posts, the suspect alleging that his mother gave him a box to bury a cat he killed. Sources tell ABC News that some of those posts on Discord were made in a private group. It's unclear who had access to the posts or who saw them. And tonight, we're learning more about this woman, Julie Harwell. <laughs> seen on the ground completely distraught. Her partner and their eight-year-old daughter in a different part of the store when the gunfire erupted, fearing the worst. Well, first you just, you hear the gunshots, and then I, I look down the aisle, I see all the people running, so I just grab my daughter, ran in the back. The family finally reunited 20 minutes later. Harwell speaking with our affiliate WKBW. That was the most longest way I've ever had in my life. And tonight, this supermarket in the heart of this tight-knit, historically black neighborhood, an oasis in what used to be a food desert, remains closed amid the investigation. Just chilling to see the video of that mother who thought for those 20 minutes that she had lost her daughter. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. And Stephanie, despite the fact the suspect allegedly engaged in that animal abuse, what more have you heard about what his parents may have or, or may not have known? So, Lindsay, authorities say they are looking through hundreds of messages they say the suspect posted online. He appears to write about how his parents had no idea he was collecting powerful weapons in his bedroom and that he was buying and selling silver coins to finance his ammo purchases. We do know that the FBI has spoken to his parents, Lindsay. It appears that they are cooperating. Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. Joining us once again is Buffalo Mayor Byron Brown. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us again tonight. You got to meet with President Biden today. President came with a very forceful message. He used words like racist rampage and domestic terrorism. Yesterday when we spoke, you said something needed to be done at the federal level. Did you discuss with the president any possible options moving forward to see if we can finally try to get this two-headed monster of guns and hate under control? I think... The president is very resolved to get something done about guns and hate in this country. Uh, the president spoke very forcefully. The president was very moved, it appeared, from his meeting uh, with families. Uh, the meeting went very well. The president and first lady spent a considerable amount of time uh, with the family of the 10 victims of this horrible violence in the city of Buffalo, where 10 precious lives were taken, uh, were stolen uh, by a racist gunman who wanted to take black lives. In the past decade or so, um, whoever has been really in the position of president, they've had to take on the role of healer in chief. Do you feel that your community um, has is, is feeling better um, and authentically seen by the president after this visit? A lot of pain still in this community, a lot of anger, a lot of hurt. I think the community uh, did feel comforted by the president's 
uh, being here, by the First Lady being here, certainly felt his sincerity and his desire to help this community heal and to do something meaningful to stop mass shootings in this country. This mass shooting uh, motivated by uh, racial hatred, uh, but so many mass shootings over the past several years, hundreds of mass shootings, and the president uh, seemed incredibly resolved and incredibly focused on working to get something meaningful done. I'd love to ask you as well, as the leader of this city, the second largest in the state of New York, what are some of your long-term plans to try to make your city safer, regardless of whether the state or federal authorities do anything at all? Uh, always very focused on making this community safer. In the budget that I propose for 2022-2023, we've increased uh, the budget for public safety, for police and fire, um, adding more detectives to the uh, Buffalo Police Department budget, uh, expanding the behavioral health team uh, that uh, works and responds uh, to mental health calls with clinicians, uh, money for shot spotter technology, a gunshot detection system, and other resources to support the work of our police department uh, and resources for our fire department that I didn't enumerate uh, but listed in this budget. So we are very focused on public safety. We think public safety is, is critical. We want to make sure that our children are safe going to school, uh, that people are safe going to church, that our business districts uh, where people shop and where people work are safe, so uh, we will continue to make uh, a commitment to strong, professional, respectful public safety in the city of Buffalo. Still a lot of open wounds we know in your city. Buffalo Mayor Byron Brown, we thank you so much for joining us once again tonight. Thank you very much. The cause behind our nation's formula shortage may be unveiled in the halls of Congress as baby formula makers have been called to testify as reports of children being hospitalized over the shortage now begin to surface. Our Ariel Reshef has been following us for us. Tonight, a dire consequence of that nationwide shortage. Two children hospitalized in Tennessee after their parents were forced to find an alternative to their specialized formula made by Abbott. They were dehydrated. I mean, they, they needed fluid and again because these kids have short bowel it's not like you can just give them rehydration fluids orally they needed iv hydration doctors say the toddler and preschooler from two different families needed that special type of formula because of intestinal conditions both kids had an adverse reaction to a non-abbott brand and blend the hospital has run out of the formula they need, so they are treating one patient with fluids. The other patient was released after doctors adapted a formula designed for adults. We had to take a formula that's not really, really, you know, designed for what we're using it for, and we've had to create um, some additions. The base is an adult formula uh, and alter it to where it will work for the patient. The Abbott plant that makes specialized formulas may reopen in two weeks after an agreement with the FDA, but it would take up to two more months to get their products onto shelves. And while the FDA is moving to import brands of formula not currently sold in the U.S., that could also take weeks. And Lindsay, doctors say that changing formula for most kids is okay, but as we've seen, for some kids with special health concerns, they may not be able to tolerate another formula. So experts say check with your pediatrician or treating doctors to explore every option. Lindsay? So concerning for parents. Ariel, thank you. And now we turn to the latest development in that China Eastern plane crash from last month. More than 100 passengers died, plus all crew members. And sources tell ABC News the latest flight data indicates it may not have been an accident after all. ABC transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has the details. Tonight, in a story first reported by the Wall Street Journal, investigators now believe the 737 that slammed into a mountain in China last March was deliberately crashed. Sources confirming to ABC News that officials analyzing the flight data say it clearly points to someone in the cockpit intentionally pushing the plane into a fatal nosedive. 
All 132 people on board were killed. Experts also cite evidence that the plane's landing gear was never deployed and the flaps were not engaged, both of which would have happened if the pilot or co-pilot was trying to land the plane. Investigators believe the near vertical descent, as seen in this video, would have required intentional force. If you see a dive like this, that means somebody is forcing that airplane over. That's what indicates that this was not an accident. According to officials, investigators also looked into the personal life and background of one of the pilots and believe he may have been struggling through certain issues that remain undisclosed right before the crash. The new details, a chilling reminder of the German wings horror in 2015, the co-pilot locking the other pilot out of the cockpit and bringing down the Airbus A320 in the French Alps, killing 150 people. That co-pilot had been previously treated for suicidal tendencies. The most chilling aspect of this, even just with the initial speculation that it might have been a pilot who wanted to kill himself and take everybody else with him, is that it has happened before. Now, we've got to be much more aggressive now in the international community in finding out how we can make sure it never, ever happens again. Certainly a significant factor to know that that pilot had had suicidal thoughts. Gio Benitez joins us now. Gio, we know this news broke overnight in China. Uh, what are they saying about this new development? So, Lindsay, right now, China has not publicly said what it believes caused this crash. But, of course, we are waiting to hear that. Perhaps in the morning on GMA, we'll be able to talk about that. Uh, but we do know right now that Boeing does not believe that there is any mechanical problem with its 737 jets that are in service around the world, Lindsay. All right, Gio Benitez, our thanks to you. It is, of course, primary day in five states across the country. Voters went to the polls in Idaho, Kentucky, North Carolina, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. And there in the Keystone State, the Senate race is among one of the closest watched this election season. On the Democratic side, their lead contender, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, cast his vote from the hospital today. He's undergoing a procedure tonight to implant a pacemaker following a stroke on Friday. On the Republican side, party infighting a Trump endorsement and a candidate with a possible tie to the insurrection. Here's ABC's congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. With the fate of the U.S. Senate hanging in the balance, all eyes are on the state of Pennsylvania. Senator Pat Toomey is vacating his seat, and several Republicans have thrown their hats into the ring in a race that from the start has had its fair share of twists and turns. This is one of the wildest races I've ever seen, if not the wildest. There was a front runner, Sean Parnell, who entered the race and then withdrew after his estranged wife accused him of abuse. So it's, it's always been a little more unsettled. It's a three-person race to become the Republican nominee, with a number of voters still undecided. The biggest name on the ballot, Dr. Oz. Dr. Mehmet Oz is a former surgeon, best known for taking over daytime TV screens with the Dr. Oz show. Now he's looking at another career change. Pennsylvania needs a conservative who will put America first. Oz's campaign received a major the jolt way, in I April. Another person today, Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania. A coveted endorsement from former President Donald Trump, the same kind that already lifted J.D. Vance to win in the Ohio Senate primary and Alex Mooney to a win in a West Virginia House primary. It wasn't a surprise that former President Trump went with Dr. Oz because they're both two media personalities. Uh, they both understand the power of media. Uh, they both understand the power of a soundbite. Oz appeared at Trump's rally in Greensburg, Pennsylvania on May 6th. President Trump endorsed me because he said I was smart, tough, and I will never let you down. He did his homework. He wrote that announcement himself because I am smart, because I'm tough as nails, and I will never let you down. Voters we spoke to at that rally appeared divided on Oz and whether Trump made the right call. While some trusted the former president. Uh, president Trump supports Dr. Oz. I also support Dr. Oz. Others were disappointed. I just don't feel like he, he represents Pennsylvania. If you state something, if you have a, a position or a policy, stand by it and own it. Don't flip-flop. Flip-flopping has been a chief criticism of Oz's campaign. He's a Hollywood liberal that has had, held a set of positions that he has flip-flopped on every single one. While Oz has expressed hardline Republican views during his campaign, opponents have pointed out that some of his past comments don't match up. One of the key discrepancies that's in the national spotlight, abortion. Oz and the other candidates facing renewed questions on the issue after the leak of a Supreme Court opinion striking down Roe versus Wade, an issue sure to play a factor in the general election. Abortion is now on the ballot. 
abortion is going to be on the ballot for every primary going forward, and abortion is going to be on the ballot now for the general election. Oz expressed concern about abortion restrictions in Alabama on The Breakfast Club in 2019. I, I wouldn't want anyone in my family to have an abortion, but I don't want to interfere with everyone else's stuff. Life starts at conception. I'm a heart surgeon. I value it. Oz is still toward the top, benefiting in part from that endorsement and the name recognition. A name like Dr. Oz, who has no political leanings previously, uh, has never had held office before, uh, nor has really engaged in a policy discourse throughout the years. It allows him to catapult to the top, uh, and he's been able to stay there due to the name recognition, and that automatically brings in fundraising um, as well. On primary day, ABC News was the only network with Oz as he cast his vote in Huntington Valley. I won. I'm very proud of the president's endorsement. He said I was smart, tough, and I never let you down. And I just cast a vote for myself, which is not a humble thing to do, but it's what I'm humbling asking all Pennsylvanians to do. Oz's chief adversary for much of the race has been David McCormick, the former CEO of Bridgewater Associates in Connecticut. McCormick, a Pennsylvania native, served in the Bush administration before moving to the hedge fund. His wife, Dina Powell, served in the Trump White House. He's really run as a conservative firebrand. I think that he has stuck around because he's trying to make the, the pitch that he's the more authentic, true conservative. McCormick's opponent jumping on his business dealings with alleged ties to China. He made his fortune in China, and he is China first. Ms. McCormick's campaign defending the candidate, saying he's been tough on China his whole life, and that he's the only one in the race with proven experience of standing up to the Chinese Communist Party. But Trump himself attacking McCormick at his rally. Well, I don't know David well. And he may be a nice guy, but he's not MAGA. He's not MAGA. McCormick and Oz both have financial strength in their corners, each raising more than $15 million, much of it loans from their own pockets. And they've invested quite a bit in attacking each other. Mehmet Oz, a complete and total fraud. The real McCormick outsourcing our jobs, defending China. It's ugly, and it's nonstop. If you live in Pennsylvania, you are going to see four or five ads in a row. For voters, there's a lot of kind of just oversaturation and fatigue there, um, which could impact what they decide to do at the polls as well. As Oz and McCormick duke it out, a grassroots candidate has surged to the forefront. You do not have to hold your nose and vote for the lesser of two evils. Conservative commentator Kathy Barnett has just a fraction of the funds compared to her two opponents, but has emerged as a formative opponent in the polls, recently nearing their levels. At Trump's rally to support Dr. Oz, a number of voters ABC News spoke with showed their support for Barnett. Kathy Barnett. Oh, I'm with Kathy Barnett all the way. I love Kathy Barnett. As Kathy Barnett brings a totally new demographic to that stage. She's an African-American woman, a conservative commentator who has really run a an excellent grassroots campaign. She's also jumped on her rival's former and long-standing out-of-state residency. McCormick in Connecticut, Oz, a longtime resident of New Jersey. I can promise uh, the people of Pennsylvania that when these carpetbaggers lose, you will never see them again. And if they should win, you will never see them again. Burnett's personal story of being the byproduct of rape has helped her connect with voters and has galvanized her base. I was not just a lump of cells. As you can see, I'm still not just a lump of cells. My life has value. But as Burnett has risen to the top, so too have previous tweets she has sent displaying homophobic and anti-Muslim opinions. Barnett denying making those statements on primary day. That is not true again. That is, that is a narrative that fits the agenda of those who do not want the people of Pennsylvania to have a better choice. I have said nothing of that kind. That is not true. It is all a lie. And ABC News verifying these images first shared by an independent researcher showing Barnett marching toward the Capitol on January 6th. As a law-abiding citizen, I wanted to hear what my president had to say. We prayed for our country. We laughed. We met new friends. We got on the bus and we came back home. And I believe that is overwhelmingly the people who went and participated or went there on January 6th. The race posing another test of Trump's influence on the Republican Party. And if his endorsement carries the weight that candidates need to win.
uh, when you have former President Trump endorsing you, that automatically gets you the headlines. But then you also, too, have different factions of the Republican base uh, who are just as active in the state of Pennsylvania, just as active in the minds of voters who are endorsing other candidates. The Republican Party in Pennsylvania, I think they see Trump as their leader, but I think they also feel like they have the autonomy to support Trump and support someone else. It'll be fascinating to see how this all plays out. Rachel Scott joins us now from Philadelphia. Rachel, with polls set to close in less than an hour in this critical Senate primary, what are you looking for in particular as far as the results on the GOP side? Well, the big headline, obviously, here, Lindsay, is just the test of the power of Trump's endorsement here. We saw that play out, obviously, in Ohio, helping propel J.D. Vance to victory there. But the big question is, is will it carry over here to Pennsylvania, a state where people have been working to out-Trump each other in this race as well? Another thing I'm really watching for, Lindsay, is just the undecided voters. You know, polls show that around 18 percent of Republican voters were still having to make up their minds. They were still undecided. We certainly met many any of them at uh, Dr. Oz's event just the night before today's primary. And so I'm very eager to see whether or not those undecided voters decided to lean toward Dr. Oz or whether or not they went with Kathy Burnett. Right. Lindsay? How much water that Trump endorsement holds there. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. We'll be checking back with you in a little later, of course. And for more on the Democratic side of the race, let's bring in our Devin Dwyer, who's at Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman's campaign headquarters tonight. Devin, as we mentioned earlier, he is hospitalized tonight. What's the latest on that? Are there any indications that, that that's had an impact on today? Yeah, a remarkable curveball, Lindsay. At the 11th hour for the front runner in this race, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman remains in a hospital at this hour. Uh, in fact, he's been there since Friday. He suffered a stroke, and in fact, he said doctors told him he didn't have any cognitive damage. Uh, but today's campaign announced that just as voting was getting underway, he went into surgery. He got a pacemaker and a defibrillator. The campaign just a short time ago, putting out a statement saying he was in surgery for two and a half hours, uh, being released at about 6 o'clock Eastern time. It was a successful procedure. He's now resting. He will not be here tonight, Lindsay. Uh, but the impact on the vote is really unclear. On the one hand, uh, he was up you know, double digits in the polls. Uh, voters here have been voting early for weeks. His rivals weren't making an issue of it. On the other hand, he wasn't on the trail in the home stretch, and a lot of voters might uh, be given some pause by the fact that he has such a serious health scare at this uh, late stage. Still in his trademark hoodie, even uh, though he's hospitalized there. And Devin, there's a, a lot on the line, of course, for Democrats in this Senate race. And I understand that many see this as their best chance of, of flipping a Republican seat. Yeah, you know, we've talked about it before. The 50-50 Senate in Washington uh, has given Democrats very little margin, Lindsay. But this seat in Pennsylvania, this open seat, is seen as their best chance to take back a seat from Republicans to grow their majority, potentially. Uh, the, the Senate map nationally, very favorable for Democrats uh, this November. They're not defending any seats in states that Donald Trump won. Uh, but as you know well, uh, Pennsylvania is a light blue state. Biden uh, only won here by 75,000 votes in 2020. So a lot on the line here for Democrats. Uh, and if John Fetterman is their nominee in this Senate race, uh, they really got to hope that he stays healthy, Lindsay. And once again, Devin will be checking in with you all night. Thanks so much for that. And when we come back, Amber Heard grilled during cross-examination. Once again, we have the latest. The Buffalo carnage has reminded us all of our society's challenges with guns, but in major cities, it is a daily struggle. Coming up, our conversation with the Philadelphia Police Commissioner. What should we all be thinking about if we want to get serious about stopping the bloodshed in our communities? But up next, the truth is out there, so they say. But did we get closer to learning what that truth is during a hearing today about so-called UFOs? With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. 
These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back now to the search for answers to the unexplained, a series of unidentified aerial phenomena spotted by military pilots or what most of us call UFOs. Congress held a hearing on them for the first time in more than 50 years today. ABC's Terry Moran has this report. The military calls them unidentified aerial phenomena, UFOs in other words. Oh my gosh. They've mystified us for decades, but they also may be a real national security concern. Today, a House Intelligence Subcommittee held the first congressional hearing on these close encounters in more than half a century. We want to know what's out there as much as you want to know what's out there. Pentagon officials now say there have been close to 400 military encounters with things in the sky they cannot currently explain. That's up from 144 reported last year. Pentagon officials avoided speculation, but admitted how baffling this uh, is. I, I can't point to something that definitively was not uh, man-made, but I can point to a number of examples in which remain unresolved. Some incidents have been debunked, like this famous so-called pyramid video leaked in 2021. Whoa, let's get close. <laughs> officials couldn't explain it at the time, but they now say it's drones in the sky, distorted by a night vision lens to look like flying pyramids. Some interesting intel there. Terry Moran joins us now. Terry, what's the ultimate goal of the Pentagon with these hearings and testimony? Lindsay, the first goal is to comply with really a congressional demand now to shine some, shine some sunlight on a subject that really has been shrouded in mystery and fantasy and speculation. And the military also really wants now the public and certainly everyone in the military to participate in a search for answers. They now know after analysis for decades that whatever they are looking at is not a, a flying object or a flying machine known to the United States of America. It is flying in ways that we cannot replicate and they can't determine what these things are. And so they want to encourage and destigmatize this whole issue of UFOs to bring it into the sunlight of uh, away from speculation and into research, observation, and hopefully at the end of the day, some answers. Lindsay? All really quite fascinating. Terry Moran, our thanks to you.
Still ahead here on Prime, is Elon Musk backing out of his Twitter takeover attempt? Gas prices at this point are straight out of control and they may be getting worse. We have the latest predictions. And where do so many of these guns used in these relentless mass shootings come from? We take a look by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day from Secretary of State Antony Blinken on this International Day against homophobia, transphobia, and biphobia. black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put people to your life like this. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risked my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. Welcome back, everyone. We know from the alleged Buffalo Shooters online racist diatribe detailing his plans that he had three guns and intended to continue his shooting rampage in the African-American community. We also know that he legally purchased two of the guns and his father bought the third as a gift for hunting. That led us to take a look at legally purchased guns and mass shootings by the numbers. From 1966 to 2019, 77% of mass shooters bought their guns legally, according to the Justice Department research. As for underage shooters, more than 80% stole weapons from family members. 2017, the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history, more than 50 killed. Talking, of course, about Las Vegas, the casino shooter, he legally purchased 33 guns in 12 months. 2018, the anti-Semitic extremist who killed 11 people at the Tree of Life Synagogue legally bought his weapon. 2019, a shooter at a Walmart in El Paso targeting Latinos killed more than 20 people. He legally bought his AK-47 online. Many mass shooters actually favor semi-automatic weapons like AK-47s and AR-15s. They're used in 25% of mass shootings, but fewer than 1% of overall gun crime. Decades ago, mass shootings were more common at workplaces. More recently, schools and places of worship have become targets. But the one constant for more than 50 years is the vast majority of these horrific attacks have been committed with legally purchased weapons. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. We're learning new details in that other mass shooting over the weekend, the one inside a California church. Several popular candies are being recalled. We'll tell you why. But first, look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com.
so much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. President Biden and the First Lady pausing in prayer and a moment of silence at a growing memorial outside Top Supermarket on the east side of Buffalo, New York. The president meeting with the victims' families, promising this country will stand by them in this time of mourning and condemning what he called a racist rampage. What happened here is simple and straightforward. Terrorism. Domestic terrorism. White supremacy is a poison. Oh my God, he shot so many people in there. A senior law enforcement source telling ABC alleged gunman 18-year-old Peyton Gendron self-radicalized in the pandemic, absorbing hate-filled social media posts and posting increasingly violent and racist rhetoric himself in the weeks leading up to Saturday's attack. The predominantly black community reeling over the 10 lives lost when police say Gendron stormed the supermarket armed with an AR-15 assault Style rifle live streaming the whole thing. And I watched the video. <laughs> he shot my mom once. My mom was was lay, was laying on the ground. He went and reloaded. <laughs> And he shot my mom again. The massacre renewing calls for greater gun control. Exclusive images, parishioners pinning to the ground the shooting suspect who opened fire on their congregation. Beside them, that knife. And to the right, that blurred image, the fallen Dr. John Cheng, one of several heroes of Sunday's church service shooting. The day had started with a celebration. About 50 people at the Taiwanese Presbyterian congregation welcoming back Pastor Billy Chang from Taiwan. The man police say opened fire, killing one person and wounding five, has been charged with one count of murder and five counts of premeditated attempted murder. The suspect, 68-year-old David Chow, could face the death penalty if convicted on all charges. Billionaire Elon Musk says he wants more information before moving forward with his proposed buyout of Twitter. In a filing with federal regulators, Twitter insisted that only about 5% of its accounts are fake or spam accounts, so-called bots. But potential new owner Elon Musk thinks the number is probably closer to 20%. He's demanding that Twitter provide evidence to back up its 5% estimate. While not a deal breaker, he says the purchase won't move forward until he sees proof. 
For the first time ever, one state has topped $6 a gallon for gas. The average price for a gallon of regular unleaded gas in California is now $6.02. Five other states all along the West Coast have topped $5 a gallon. The national average right now sits about $4.52 a gallon, which is still an all-time high. The price of a barrel of oil is also on the rise now at $114. Several popular candies are being recalled. The maker of Skittles, Starburst, and Lifesavers gummies warning of a possible very thin metal strand embedded in some products or loose in the bag. The recall includes 13 products ranging from 3.5 ounce bags to 12 ounces. Customers should throw out the recalled packages. Queen Elizabeth making a surprise appearance at London's Paddington Station, the 96-year-old monarch on her feet with a cane in hand, visiting a subway line named in her honor. It's now just over two weeks until her platinum jubilee, celebrating her 70 years on the throne. Amber Heard was back on the stand today as cross-examination continued in the high-profile defamation trial between her and her ex-husband, Johnny Depp. The former couple was married from 2015 to 2017 and have lobbed abuse claims at each other during their individual testimonies. We do want to warn you that there is mention of sexual assault, which could be triggering for some. Our Janae Norman has this report. Because he's, he knows he's lying. Otherwise, why can't he look at me? I survived. I survived that man and I'm here and I'm able to look at him. Amber Heard back on the stand for a second day of cross-examination in the multi-million dollar defamation suit filed by ex-husband Johnny Depp. That's become a case of he said, she said amid allegations of abuse by both sides. This is you and your friends at Coachella, correct? That is correct. There's no injuries to you, are there, Ms. Heard, visible in this picture? You cannot see any visible injury, no. Heard testifying she suffered verbal, physical, and sexual abuse at the hands of Depp, detailing how she used makeup to cover bruises. Depp's lawyers looking to cast doubt on domestic abuse claims, accusing Heard of doctoring photos from May 2016 that appear to show bruising. Isn't it true you just edited these photographs? No, I've never edited a photograph. Didn't you just enhance the saturation for one of these photos to make your face look more red? Uh, no, that's incorrect. I didn't touch it. And pushing back with pictures of their own, showing images of her one day after she claims Depp broke her nose. Your nose doesn't appear to be injured in any of these pictures, does it, Miss Heard? That's why I'm wearing makeup. Right. And makeup covers up swelling, right? Makeup will not cover up swelling. I swell, though. Making the case that Depp is the real victim. I don't want a divorce. I never wanted a divorce. I never wanted a divorce. And you came around the bed and start punching on me. On the stand, Heard testified to Depp's jealousy, which she said would lead to violence. Depp's team playing audio, attempting to show the jury it was Heard who was jealous. Is there no other place for you to run in your 15 other houses to go run? Come on, go be a real married man. Go deal with your the way that a man does. Go run to the next house. Every man does. Go run away. That's what I do. You're the most spoiled you got everybody out here almost oh, full, but it don't right, last you're long. Right. I'm I've been sorry. here a lot longer you're than right. you. You're right. You got it figured out. I yeah, because no one does no, 21 no. drugs straight when they're in their 20s. No, you're right. That's not selling you out. You were the jealous one in this relationship, weren't you, Miss Heard? I think he was indicating I was jealous of his career. But now you've twisted it to say it was Mr. Depp. That's the jealous one. Johnny's always been very jealous when I worked, when I did anything, friends. Yes, he's always been very jealous. Depp's attorney returning to that infamous fight in 2015 in Australia, which allegedly left Depp with a severed finger, questioning why there were no medical records stemming from the alleged sexual assault, which Heard said left her bleeding. And there is not a single medical record reflecting treatment for any of those injuries. Is there, Ms. Heard? I didn't seek treatment. Asked whether she was responsible for any of the writing on the walls from that incident, Heard saying no that it was all Depp. I can't promise you I won't get physical death. God, I sometimes get so mad and lose it. Playing audio recordings of their fights. You got physical with Mr. Depp often during your relationship, didn't you? I had to defend myself as best I could. Um, didn't seem to make much of a difference. You just couldn't control yourself, could you, Miss Heard? I tried to defend myself when I could, um, but it was after years of not defending myself. I accidentally, I swear, 
when I was trying to close the door, I guess it scraped your toes. I, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't mean to do that. And then you f clocked me. I, I remember hitting you as a response to the door thing. You didn't mean to hit me in the head with the door, but you meant to I didn't punch mean... me in the jaw. Okay, I'm sorry I hit you. I didn't mean to hit you, but it was in, a res in response. I just reacted in response to my foot. I just reacted. The cross-examination ending with questions about Hurd's ex, Tazia Van Rie, and allegations of abuse in that relationship and an effort to show a pattern of Hurd being the aggressor. So Mr. Depp is not the only domestic partner you've assaulted, is he, Ms. Hurd? I've never assaulted Mr. Depp or anyone else that I've been romantically linked to, ever. Heard insists that the 2018 Washington Post op-ed she penned labeling herself a public figure representing domestic abuse had nothing to do with Depp. This is about Mr. Depp, isn't it? No, so it's not about May Johnny. To, it's Ms. about Heard, what happened to me Ms. after. Heard, it's that very op-ed that Depp is suing Heard over for $50 million, saying the implications that it was about him were clear despite never naming him claiming it cost the 58-year-old movie roles, despite his insistence he never physically hurt her. 38-year-old Hurd countersuing Depp for $100 million for calling her a liar and claiming Depp's team orchestrated an ongoing smear campaign against her. Closing arguments are set for May 27th. Quite a contentious divorce there, or aftermath. Our thanks to Janae for that. In New Jersey, emergency crews swooped in to rescue teens on a beach who became trapped in sand. Authorities say the boy and girl were digging a 10-foot hole when it collapsed. No word on their conditions. As we enter the summer beach season, authorities across the country have been warning about the dangers of digging holes on the beach. And our weather teams are tracking severe storms moving into the Midwest. If you live in Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, and Missouri, all are risk for possible tornadoes, dangerous winds and hail. This is Texas is recording triple digit heat. It was at least 90 degrees for the 10th straight day in a row in Dallas. That intense heat is expected to move into the northeast by the weekend. Turning now to concerns about gun violence in this country, whether it's in big cities or the mass shootings that are impacting communities of all sizes, this country has not been able to do anything to curb the gun violence. And so we are talking to people on the front lines to discuss what can be done to stop the relentless bloodshed. Philadelphia Police Commissioner Danielle Outlaw joins us now. Commissioner, this primary Tuesday is especially a big one in your state, so we are so grateful that you took the time to talk with us tonight. Let's focus on the issue of gun violence and what we can do about it. What are you seeing in particular in Philadelphia in terms of crime? How much is gun related? A lot of it is gun related. Thank you for even asking that question. We've been saying that a lot of these conflicts have been escalated and have turned into non-fatal shootings or homicides merely because of the fact guns have been introduced into these equations. We've seen younger people being shot. We've seen younger people as our shooters. And because what has become for it, uh, what used to be, uh, you know, as an example, a fight after school has now turned into a shooting because these conflicts, again, has introduced guns. We seized over or close to 6,000 illegal crime guns off the street last year. What in particular do you feel lawmakers need to do in order to address this? Again, it's common sense. Uh, it's something as simple as if your gun is lost or stolen, a law that requires you to report it as lost or stolen would be an easy fix. We are doing everything that we can to work with our local, state, and federal partners, whether it's the ATF, the FBI, uh, to identify where these guns are coming from, and then not just tracing them, but making sure that we connect them to other shootings to get ahead of the next shooter. But there's only so much that we can do with the influx of guns that we're seeing. Of course, the nation's focus has now turned to violence and mental health once again after this weekend's mass shooting in Buffalo. Do you see a connection between the two? And, and what would you like to see done to address the mental health side of things? You know what, that's a tricky one. I, I would say the answer is yes, but a lot of what we're seeing goes undiagnosed. So it's it's pretty easy for us to determine, or usually it's easy for us to determine if someone's experiencing some form of crisis or if there's a developmental disability. But I think with the last two years, with this pandemic, the mental or psychological impacts um, have been tough to measure. And without us having our warm touch points, whether it's in schools, with everything being shut down and folks being so isolated, I think that's one of the things that's driving the numbers that we're seeing, which tells us that our response to gun violence has to be comprehensive. It has to include social services. It has to include uh, housing and ensuring that all of the basic human needs and rights 
are addressed. And let's go back to policing and the issue in particular of community relations. What are your struggles in Philadelphia? Oh, wow. So there's, you know, obviously, whether you're talking about here in Philadelphia or nationwide, there's always been, uh, you know, issues challenges with our relationships. Sometimes I feel like we take 20 steps forward and all it takes is one critical incident, whether it's here in the city or anywhere in the country or in the world, and it takes us 20 years back. So a lot of it has to do with trust building and ensuring that our community trusts us enough to come forward with information, to go to court as a witness to help us solve a lot of these crimes. And then also at the same time, knowing that we're human beings behind the uniform and that we're there to help and that we're there as allies and to be a part of the community as opposed to uh, adversaries. And you talked in particular about people needing to see you as partners and not adversaries. What would you say your vision is for improving the police relations in your community? So now that things are starting to reopen, it's getting back out to meeting people where they are, whether it's in rec centers or our places of worship in the communities to make sure again, that they can see us, not just virtually, uh, but they can get to know who their assigned officers are, assigned to their area, they're not there today, gone tomorrow, getting to know people on a first name basis, knowing where our young people live, ensuring that we maintain a bridge and a connection to our young people, because that's where we really drop the ball. And lastly, as you know, some experts say that the problem is that guns are simply too readily available. Of course, there are others who would disagree. Uh, New York, for example, has strong gun laws, uh, and that did not stop the carnage in Buffalo. Are there any immediate steps that could be taken in order to help keep guns from criminal hands? Yeah, I think there's at least a couple of things, right? So from the from the community standpoint, know what's going on in your house. And I say this because, again, there are more and more young people that are picking up guns for whatever the reason are. Some may think that they have to protect themselves. Some see them being uh, glorified, uh, whether it's video games or whatever it is. And just to say I'm not pushing for censorship, I'm just saying as a parent myself, know what's going on in your home. Uh, the other thing is ensuring that there are consequences. There are far too many people that we've seen um, that are carrying guns illegally and they're committing acts of violent crime. And then at times they may even be committing an act of violent crime or a shooting while they're out of custody after already being arrested. So that's something that I think local commissioners or police chiefs have to continue to work with their local prosecutors or their federal prosecutors to ensure that we are targeting one, the right people. Commissioner Outlaw, we so appreciate your time and insight. Thank you so much for coming My on the pleasure. show. Thank you for having me. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden visiting the scene of that horrific supermarket shooting in Buffalo, where they paid their respects and spoke to the victims' families. How much longer will presidents have to play the role of consoler in chief following a mass shooting before we as a nation say enough is enough? That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Next hour, the polls are set to close in some states. Our election coverage is starting to heat up. Our teams are standing by. Stay with us. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine.
The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Christopher Steele. The guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Dallas police arrested a man for last week's shooting at a Dallas hair salon that injured three women of Korean descent. The police chief called Jeremy Theron Smith's attack a hate crime and said the FBI is now involved. According to arrest documents, Smith's girlfriend told investigators that he, quote, had delusions about Asian Americans trying to harm him. Sweden and Finland will formally submit requests to join NATO tomorrow. Joining the military alliance is a seismic shift for both countries since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Membership requires unanimous approval. Turkey's president says he plans to object. For the first time in 50 years, top Pentagon officials publicly briefed Congress on UFOs today. The Navy reports about 400 sightings between 2004 and 2021. That's a huge increase from the previously known 144. They said the increase is largely due to reduced stigma in reporting, and new systems will make it easier. As for what or who exactly is out there, they say many appear to be drones or other man-made objects, but others still remain unidentifiable. It is primary day in five states across the country. Voters went to the polls in Idaho, Kentucky, North Carolina, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. The Senate race in the Keystone State is among one of the closest being watched this election season. On the Democrat side, their lead contender, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, he cast his vote from the hospital today. He just finished undergoing a procedure tonight to implant a, piece, a pacemaker after a stroke. On the Republican side, party in fighting a Trump endorsement and a candidate with possible ties to the insurrection. Here's ABC's congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. With the fate of the U.S. Senate hanging in the balance, all eyes are on the state of Pennsylvania. Senator Pat Toomey is vacating his seat, and several Republicans have thrown their hats into the ring in a race that, from the start, has had its fair share of twists and turns. This is one of the wildest races I've ever seen, if not the wildest. There was a frontrunner, Sean Parnell, who entered the race and then withdrew after his estranged wife accused him of abuse. So it's, it's always been a little more unsettled. It's a three-person race to become the Republican nominee, with a number of voters still undecided. The biggest name on the ballot, Dr. Oz. Dr. Mehmet Oz is a former surgeon, best known for taking over daytime TV screens with the Dr. Oz show. Now he's looking at another career change. Pennsylvania needs a conservative who will put America first. Oz's campaign received a major way, jolt in April. another person today, Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania. A coveted endorsement from former President Donald Trump, the same kind that already lifted J.D. Vance to win in the Ohio Senate primary and Alex Mooney to a win in a West Virginia House primary. It wasn't a surprise that former President Trump went with Dr. Oz because they're both two media personalities. Uh, they both understand the power of media. Uh, they both understand the power of a soundbite. Oz appeared at Trump's rally in Greensburg, Pennsylvania on May 6th. President Trump endorsed me because he said I was smart, tough, and I will never let you down. He did his homework. He wrote that announcement himself because I am smart, because I'm tough as nails, and I will never let you down. Voters we spoke to at that rally appeared divided on Oz and whether Trump made the right call. While some trusted the former president. Uh, president Trump supports Dr. Oz. I also support Dr. Oz. Others were disappointed. I just don't feel like he, he represents Pennsylvania. If you state something, if you have a, a position or a policy, stand by it and own it. Don't flip-flop. Flip-flopping has been a chief criticism of Oz's campaign. He's a Hollywood liberal that has had, held a set of positions that he has flip-flopped on every single one. While Oz has expressed hardline Republican views during his campaign, opponents have pointed out that some of his past comments don't match up. One of the key discrepancies that's in the national spotlight, abortion. 
Oz and the other candidates facing renewed questions on the issue after the leak of a Supreme Court opinion striking down Roe versus Wade, an issue sure to play a factor in the general election. Abortion is now on the ballot. Abortion is going to be on the ballot for every primary going forward, and abortion is going to be on the ballot now for the general election. Oz expressed concern about abortion restrictions in Alabama on The Breakfast Club in 2019. I, I wouldn't want anyone in my family to have an abortion, but I don't want to interfere with everyone else's stuff. Life starts at conception. I'm a heart surgeon. I value it. Oz is still toward the top, benefiting in part from that endorsement and the name recognition. A name like Dr. Oz, who has no political leanings previously, uh, has never had held office before, uh, nor has really engaged in a policy discourse throughout the years. It allows him to catapult to the top, uh, and he's been able to stay there due to the name recognition, and that automatically brings in fundraising um, as well. On primary day, ABC News was the only network with Oz as he cast his vote in Huntington Valley. I won. I'm very proud of the president's endorsement. He said I was smart, tough, and I never let you down. And I just cast a vote for myself, which is not a humble thing to do, but it's what I'm humbly asking all Pennsylvanians to do. Oz's chief adversary for much of the race has been David McCormick, the former CEO of Bridgewater Associates in Connecticut. McCormick, a Pennsylvania native, served in the Bush administration before moving to the hedge fund. His wife, Dina Powell, served in the Trump White House. He's really run as a conservative firebrand. I think that he has stuck around because he's trying to make the, the pitch that he's the more authentic, true conservative. McCormick's opponent jumping on his business dealings with China. He is China first. Okay. He made his fortune in China. McCormick's campaign defending the candidate, saying he's been tough on China his whole life and that he's the only one in the race with proven experience of standing up to the Chinese Communist Party. But Trump himself attacking McCormick at his rally. Well, I don't know David well, and he may be a nice guy, but he's not MAGA. He's not MAGA. McCormick and Oz both have financial strength in their corners, each raising more than $15 million, much of it loans from their own pockets. And they've invested quite a bit in attacking each other. Mehmet Oz, a complete and total fraud. The real McCormick outsourcing our jobs, defending China. It's ugly and it's nonstop. If you live in Pennsylvania, you are going to see four or five ads in a row. For voters, there's a lot of kind of just oversaturation and fatigue there, um, which could impact what they decide to do at the polls as well. As Oz and McCormick duke it out, a grassroots candidate has surged to the forefront. You do not have to hold your nose and vote for the lesser of two evils. Conservative commentator Kathy Barnett has just a fraction of the funds compared to her two opponents, but has emerged as a formative opponent in the polls, recently nearing their levels. At Trump's rally to support Dr. Oz, a number of voters ABC News spoke with showed their support for Barnett. Kathy Barnett. Oh, I'm with Kathy Barnett all the way. I love Kathy Barnett. Because Kathy Barnett brings a totally new demographic to that stage. She's an African-American woman, a conservative commentator who has really run a an excellent grassroots campaign. She's also jumped on her rival's former and long-standing out-of-state residency. McCormick in Connecticut, Oz, a longtime resident of New Jersey. I can promise uh, the people of Pennsylvania that when these carpetbaggers lose, you will never see them again. And if they should win, you will never see them again. Burnett's personal story of being the byproduct of rape has helped her connect with voters and has galvanized her base. I was not just a lump of cells. As you can see, I'm still not just a lump of cells. My life has value. But as Burnett has risen to the top, so too have previous tweets she has sent displaying homophobic and anti-Muslim opinions. Barnett denying making those statements on primary day. That is not true again. That is, that is a narrative that fits the agenda of those who do not want the people of Pennsylvania to have a better choice. I have said nothing of that kind. That is not true. It is all a lie. And ABC News verifying these images first shared by an independent researcher showing Barnett marching toward the Capitol on January 6th. Do you have any regrets about being there on January 6th? Any regrets Thank at all? Oh, excuse me. Did you go inside the Capitol that day? No, she did not. Then that anything to the contrary. The race posing another test of Trump's influence on the Republican Party. And if his endorsement 
carries the weight that candidates need to win. Uh, when you have former President Trump endorsing you, that automatically gets you the headlines. But then you also, too, have different factions of the Republican base uh, who are just as active in the state of Pennsylvania, just as active in the minds of voters who are endorsing other candidates. The Republican Party in Pennsylvania, I think they see Trump as their leader, but I think they also feel like they have the autonomy to support Trump and support someone else. Really shaping up to be a few nail biter races there in Pennsylvania. Rachel Scott joins us now from Philadelphia. Rachel, polls are now closed in Pennsylvania. And as we start to see the results coming in, what are you watching in particular tonight? That big test of Trump's endorsement power here tonight, Lindsay, and not only in the state of Pennsylvania, but also in the other states that are having primaries today. This is the biggest primary day yet. We're already seeing some of these projections roll in. Ted Budd, who the former president endorsed in North Carolina, he's projected to win that race. And so now all eyes are here on the state of Pennsylvania. Will Dr. Oz pull this off? I can tell you from talking to voters here, this is a party that is not yet far removed from former President Donald Trump. In fact, in the days and the weeks after the January 6th insurrection, this is a party that has actually grown a lot closer to the former president. We hear so much from voters about those America first policies. They want a candidate that really mirrors the former president, Lindsay. And Rachel, as you reported, Kathy Barnett has faced an increasing number of questions about her prior mm -hmm. statements and record. If she does end up the winner tonight, it, it seems like those questions will only mount at this point. Yes, and you know, Kathy Barnett is someone that really flew under the radar for most of this race, but she had this momentum, this surge in the polls, and then all of a sudden, we started to see some of her past tweets from almost a decade ago that are still actually on her Twitter profile come out. Uh, Anti-Muslim tweets, as well as homophobic tweets as well. She's not backing down from any of those. Uh, when she's pressed about it, when she's asked about it, she actually says that she would never say those words, but yet they still live on her Twitter page. But of course, she's going to be under fire for not only that, but also that image uh, that has been verified by independent researchers showing her marching toward the Capitol on January 6th. We tried to press her today on whether or not she regretted anything from that day. She says that they marched there and that she went home and her campaign says that she did not enter the Capitol, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. And now let's check in on the Democratic side of things there in Pennsylvania, where the leading candidate is in the hospital recovering from a stroke. He is now out of surgery tonight. Polls have closed. Let's bring in Devin Dwyer, who's at John Fetterman's campaign headquarters. Devin, Democratic voters really have a stark choice here as far as the candidates go. Oh, they sure did, Lindsay. The three top candidates in the race on the Democratic side really reflect the microcosm of diversity and views and backgrounds in the Democratic Party and the debate the party is having about which direction it wants to go in the future. There's, of course, Malcolm Kenyatta. He's the 30-year-old state representative from Philly, the first and only gay black man in the state legislature here. Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, six foot nine, a behemoth in politics, an unconventional politician. We talked earlier, uh, he wears the Dickies in the Carhartt sweatshirts. He wears gym shorts year-round. He's an anti-establishment progressive. Uh, curses sometimes on the trail. Uh, and then there was Congressman Connor Lamb, uh, the man many thought would be the front runner in this race, has struggled to gain traction. He's a moderate, a centrist. He did win here in Trump country in 2018, uh, but has struggled uh, to, to gain a foothold. I caught up with Connor Lamb a little bit earlier today, Lindsay. He said tonight's results will offer big lessons for the Democratic Party nationally. Lieutenant Governor Fetterman and I have offered two very different paths based on two different sets of experience and two different personalities. And so I think there will be an extent to which today's result shows sort of which way the party wants to move. Um, and then, you know, we're all going to have to be together. We're, we're trying to protect our democracy at the end of the day. So. And I asked Connor Lamb, Lindsay, which of the Republican candidates in that scrambled field that Rachel was talking about would be the easiest target, the easiest challenger. He said he wasn't going to forecast. He said all of them were essentially the same in his view, uh, carbon copies of Donald Trump. He said Democrats in this race will close ranks with each other, unify whoever wins behind whoever wins tonight uh, to take on that uh, Republican nominee, Lindsay. And Devin, as you mentioned, uh, you're at Fetterman headquarters. He won't be there. Physically, will there perhaps be any Zooms or his wife present in the room? 
Yeah, you know, we've been asking that. He is in the hospital at this hour. He was out of surgery just about 6 o'clock Eastern time, so only two hours ago, uh, as we've been reporting. Uh, a shocker today, uh, 15 minutes before he went into surgery, uh, the press, the community, voters were notified that he was receiving a pacemaker and a defibrillator. Um, common procedure, but also perhaps an indicator of more serious heart disease than they've been letting on. Uh, he will remain recovering tonight. No word yet if he'll be zooming in here, but his wife, Giselle will be here addressing this crowd of supporters. Fetterman, of course, leading in the polls tonight. Uh, and she has a story. The second lady of Pennsylvania has an interesting story in her own right. She's a Brazilian-American, a former undocumented immigrant who has founded uh, a number of nonprofits to help needy families in this state uh, work with food security. So an interesting story. We know she'll be here. Perhaps there are three young kids, a lot of supporters. But the lieutenant governor, the front runner in this race tonight, Lindsay, uh, as these polls are closed, remains in the hospital. All right, Devin Dwyer, our thanks to you. We'll be checking in with you throughout the night. And now let's bring in ABC News political director Rick Klein. And Rick, we've already gotten some news about what will surely be a highly contested Senate seat this November in North Carolina. Former President Trump can take a bit of a victory lap with Ted Budd there after his endorsement. Yeah, no question about that. You know, the big thing tonight that changes as opposed to previous primaries, you were talking about battleground states. Pennsylvania, North Carolina, two of the states that you're going to see contested very heavily through the fall. Democrats think in both states they've got an opportunity with a retiring Republican. They like Sherry Beasley. They like the personality profile she brings. They like the idea that she'd be the, the, the only black woman serving in the United States Senate. And as for the Democrats, Ted Budd, uh, Donald Trump went out on a bit of a limb there. Uh, got involved even though the primary included a former governor of the state and also a former congressman who's very close to, to, to former President Trump. Uh, he went in early, he stuck by Ted Budd, and he seems to be on track to a decisive victory in that race. Okay, let's take a step back now and look at the big picture heading into tonight. Lay out for us uh, where the contests are being held tonight and, and what's at stake. Yeah, as I said, biggest night of voting we've seen so far in the primary season, and the idea that you have battleground states makes this a little bit different. The main event all night is going to be Pennsylvania. This is the state that Democrats have circled from the beginning. They think it's an opportunity for them to go on offense. Of course, it was a critical state back in 2020. North Carolina in a bit of a similar spot. Kentucky, a deep red state, although Democrats would love to be able to beat Senator Rand Paul. Out west, an interesting race in Idaho for governor where Donald Trump's got involved. And in Oregon, uh, check this out, Lindsay. Donald Trump has endorsed more than 100 candidates. Candidates, but Joe Biden has only endorsed two, and one of them is right here in Oregon, a House member who's got a progressive challenger. Uh, that is royal, the Democratic Party out west. Uh, we'll be looking to see if, if, if Biden's word carries with Democratic voters. And on the flip side, we're also, of course, watching for the impact of former President Trump's endorsements tonight. What are you watching in particular? Yeah, look, there, there's an opportunity here for him to swing and miss in a few places, particularly out in Idaho. He has endorsed the lieutenant governor against the sitting Republican governor. Not necessarily a popular choice, and we'll have to see if that gets the kind of traction. Uh, as we said, he's already been uh, victorious with the uh, the Senate race in North Carolina, but also on the ballot, Congressman Madison Cawthorn. Donald Trump's maybe the only main uh, major Republican figure still sticking with Congressman Cawthorn after all the issues that he's had. And Bo Hines, a 26-year-old newcomer, uh, same age as Madison Cawthorn, also a Trump favorite in an open seat. But in Pennsylvania, things get even bigger because State Senator Doug Mastriano is one of the leaders of the, uh, the post-January 6th efforts to overturn the election in Pennsylvania. He's on track to become the gubernatorial nominee with Trump's blessing. And the choice of Dr. Oz, that has been the major headline in the last couple of days. Republicans are worried that that decision to endorse Dr. Oz threw the, the race into turmoil. And you may end up with Kathy Barnett, who even Donald Trump thinks might not be electable statewide. And redistricting also at play tonight as some maps have changed since the 2020 election. How has that changed the midterms battleground? Yeah, look, it, it matters in states like Pennsylvania because, as you see, there are spots that are blue and spots that are deep red, including some, some, some battleground counties. This is what the new map in Pennsylvania looks like. And, and you see a whole lot of red and a whole lot of blue. Those are safe seats. You're only talking about a couple of races right here outside of Pittsburgh and a couple here in the Philadelphia suburbs in, in southeastern Pennsylvania that are potentially in play. That's where the action is going to be in Pennsylvania, and that's where it really matters what kind of nominees you'll see. Uh, similar story in North Carolina, also a, a very close presidential battleground. All of these red states, uh, the, the, these red districts, again, Madison Cawthorn here in the Western 11th District, Bo Hines in that Raleigh area, new district created with redistricting. And here's an interesting one, Clay Aiken. Uh, you remember him from American Idol. Uh, he is one of three candidates running for the Democratic nomination uh, in, in a very blue district, uh, the fourth district. So again, these are places that a, a majority could be made or broken, depending on how things work out with your nominees. Meanwhile, Kentucky, another big state voting today, not a lot of blue on that map. Uh, of course, 
course, uh, Democrats hold the, the, the Louisville area House district. They'd love to be competitive against Senator Rand Paul, but that's going to be a very tough task uh, in, in any environment. And as you just brought up, Madison Cawthorn, Bo Hines, both just 26 years old. It'll be interesting to see what happens in Kentucky, North Carolina, Pennsylvania in particular tonight. Rick Klein will come back with you in just a little bit. And now for more on tonight's Republican races, let's bring in Mark Short. He served as Legislative Affairs Director during the Trump administration, as well as former Chief of Staff to Vice President Mike Pence. Mark, thanks so much for joining hey, us tonight. Thanks for having me on. So let's focus on that key GOP Senate race in Pennsylvania. Some complex dynamics here as these three candidates are really neck and neck. What are you watching for in particular tonight? How do you potentially see this playing out? Well, I think there's a lot of similarities actually to the Ohio primary because I think you had two candidates in Dr. Oz and Dave McCormick who essentially wanted to have a pageant to see who could get Trump's endorsement. And if you do that, you fail to actually define yourself. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that whoever gets the endorsement, what's left for the other candidate. Dave McCormick has a pretty great story. He's a West Point grad who served our country in combat, came back and served in public service to the Treasury, went into the private sector and was quite successful. But I don't think that story's been told because it was all about who does Trump endorse. And that created a lane for Kathy Barnett in a time when I think a lot of the conventional wisdom is that the Dobbs decision is going to run counter to Republicans. You've actually got her with a very, very passionate personal story of her mom giving birth to her after um, a, a rape and, and basically giving birth to her at a young age. And she's able to tell a very convincing life story. And that narrative is actually, I think, helping her to define herself when the other two are battling for the Trump endorsement. So uh, I think it's going to be incredibly close to watch tonight. That's right. She has said that her mother was just 11 years old at the point that she was conceived. Uh, of course, the endorsement power of former President Trump very much on the line in that race after he backed Dr. Oz. Uh, we saw Ohio voters largely get in line behind his endorsement of J.D. Vance, who went on to win. Mm. But many Pennsylvania voters don't seem to be following suit on Dr. Oz. Why do you think that that is? Well, I think it's an important point, Lindsay. I think that uh, President Trump continues to have a very important influence and a very large influence inside the party. But I think sometimes it's an exaggerated influence by the media. Because if you think about it, where there's been these contested primaries, typically the Trump candidate's been in the 30s. Chuck Herbster in Nebraska. Uh, Vance in Ohio, Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania. You're looking at actually, you know, less than that at David Perdue in Georgia. And so, um, yes, it's an important block, but you're really seeing where it's contested primaries that the number is probably capping off in the low 30s for the candidate that um, that is uh, fought for and received the Trump endorsement. So again, I think the candidates who have done best have those who have been able to define themselves and their record. Look at, you know, uh, Governor DeWine in Ohio winning decisively. You look at Governor Kemp on a way to winning decisively in Georgia. Again, I think that uh, I don't know how Kathy Barnett's going to do, but she defined herself. And so I think those candidates who have been able to do that have succeeded uh, far more than those who have just vied for a Trump endorsement. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point that you bring up as far as her being able to define herself. Um, but with regard to record, being able to run on record, I thought it was interesting that Trump uh, last week, he said that she has many things in her past which have not properly been explained or vetted. But if she's able to do so, she'll have a wonderful future in the Republican Party and I'll be behind her all the way. Kind of hedging his bets there. Do you feel at all that the GOP should be concerned if Kathy Barnett is able to pull out an upset there? Could that put them at risk of the Democrats being able Able to pick up that seat in, in November? I, I think so. I think there's worry in the governor's race, too, with uh, Mastriano as to whether or not those are candidates that can win statewide. But, you know, I think the irony is that critics said the same about Donald Trump in 2016. So I think you have to wait and see. Let's see how, if, if Barnett does become the nominee, let's see how she handles herself. But I think that, uh, that certainly the, uh, the hurdle is going to be larger to prove yourself. Mark Short, we'll see you more in a little bit as the results continue coming in or start coming in from Pennsylvania there. And now President Biden and the First Lady visited Buffalo today, of course, where 10 lives were taken in an attack. Authorities say it was driven by racist hate. The president met with families and then addressed the nation with very forceful words condemning racist theories. ABC's Mary Bruce has this report. In Buffalo today, President Biden visiting the site of what he called a murderous racist rampage, spending over an hour and a half meeting with the families of the 10 people killed, emotionally remembering the victims one by one. Andre McNeil, 53, 
worked at a restaurant, went to buy his three-year-old son a birthday cake. <clears throat> his son's selling a birthday. Ask him, where's daddy? <clears throat> the president, blunt. What happened here is simple and straightforward. Terrorism. Terrorism. Domestic terrorism. Violence inflicted in the service of hate. The president calling out those who espouse replacement theory, the racist belief allegedly embraced by the shooting suspect that there is a conspiracy to replace white Americans with people of color. A hate that through the media and politics, the Internet, has radicalized, angry, alienated, lost, and isolated individuals into falsely believing that they will be replaced. Biden assailing the politicians and members of the media who amplify the bigoted ideology. And I condemn those who spread the lie for power, political gain, and for profit. White supremacy is a poison. It's a poison <laughs> running through, it really is. running through our body politic. And it's been allowed to fester and grow right in front of our eyes. The president declaring this hate cannot be the story of our time. We have to refuse to live in a country where black people going about a weekly grocery shopping can be gunned down by weapons of war deployed in a racist cause. Some strong words there from the president. Our thanks to Mary for that. We have our eye on election results coming in, but we're still tracking some other headlines this hour. Still to come, the shocking revelation about what or who may have brought down an airline in China. But coming up, our in-depth election coverage is about to heat up. Stay with us. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Flight data from the China Eastern jet that crashed in late March indicates that someone in the cockpit intentionally put the plane into a fatal dive. The Wall Street Journal quotes a source familiar with U.S. officials' preliminary assessment of the accident that killed all 132 people on board. Chinese investigators so far have not flagged any mechanical or flight control problems with the plane. In East Africa, this dry, rainy season continues to take its toll. Ethiopia 
is battling its worst drought in almost half a century. And in Somalia, 40% of the population is at risk of starvation. This is the fourth straight year of failed rains. Cuba is now the first country in Latin America to celebrate an LGBTQ plus history month. Advocates are holding lectures, panel discussions, and workshops throughout the month of May to promote inclusion and reflect on current issues. 13 other countries around the world mark LGBTQ plus history in different months throughout the year. Amber Heard was back on the stand today as cross-examination continued in the high-profile defamation trial between her and her ex-husband, Johnny Depp. The former couple was married from 2015 to 2017 and have lobbed abuse claims at each other during their individual testimonies. We want to warn you there is mention of sexual assault, which could be triggering for some. Our Janae Norman files this report. Because he's, he knows he's lying. Otherwise, why can't he look at me? I survived. I survived that man and I'm here and I'm able to look at him. Amber Heard back on the stand for a second day of cross-examination in the multi-million dollar defamation suit filed by ex-husband Johnny Depp. That's become a case of he said, she said amid allegations of abuse by both sides. This is you and your friends at Coachella, correct? That is correct. It's no injuries to you. Are there, Ms. Heard, visible in this picture? You cannot see any visible injury, no. Heard testifying she suffered verbal, physical, and sexual abuse at the hands of Depp, detailing how she used makeup to cover bruises. Depp's lawyers looking to cast doubt on domestic abuse claims, accusing Heard of doctoring photos from May 2016 that appear to show bruising. Isn't it true you just edited these photographs? No, I've never edited a photograph. Didn't you just enhance the saturation for one of these photos to make your face look more red? Uh, no, that's incorrect. I didn't touch it. And pushing back with pictures of their own, showing images of her one day after she claims Depp broke her nose. Your nose doesn't appear to be injured in any of these pictures, does it, Miss Heard? That's why I'm wearing makeup. Right. And makeup covers up swelling, right? Makeup will not cover up swelling. I swell, though. Making the case that Depp is the real victim. I don't want a divorce. I never wanted a divorce. I never wanted a divorce. And you came around the bed and start punching on me. On the stand, Heard testified to Depp's jealousy, which she said would lead to violence. Depp's team playing audio, attempting to show the jury it was Heard who was jealous. Is there no other place for you to run your 15 other houses to go run? Come on, go be a real married man. Go deal with the way that a man does. Go run to the next house. Every man does. Go run away. That's what I do. You are the most spoiled. Yeah. And you've got everybody out here almost oh, full, but it don't right. last long. You're right. I've been here a lot longer you're than right. you. You're right. you got to figure it out. I yeah, because no one does oh, 21 man. drugs straight when they're in their 20s. No, you're right. That's not selling you out. You were the jealous one in this relationship, weren't you, Miss Heard? I think he was indicating I was jealous of his career. But now you've twisted it to say it was Mr. Depp. That's the jealous one. Johnny's always been very jealous when I worked, when I did anything, friends. Yes, he's always been very jealous. Depp's attorney returning to that infamous fight in 2015 in Australia, which allegedly left Depp with a severed finger, questioning why there were no medical records stemming from the alleged sexual assault, which Heard said left her bleeding. And there is not a single medical record reflecting treatment for any of those injuries, is there, Ms. Heard? I didn't seek treatment. Asked whether she was responsible for any of the writing on the walls from that incident, Heard saying no, that it was all Depp. I can't promise you I won't get physical Depp. God, I sometimes get so mad, I lose it. Playing audio recordings of their fights. You got physical with Mr. Depp often during your relationship, didn't you? I had to defend myself as best I could. Um, didn't seem to make much of a difference. You just couldn't control yourself, could you, Miss Heard? I tried to defend myself when I could, um, but it was after years of not defending myself. I accidentally, I swear, when I was trying to close the door, I guess it scraped your toes. And I didn't, I, you know, I didn't mean to do that. And then you clocked me. I, I remember hitting you as a response to the door thing. You didn't mean to hit me in the head with the door, but you meant to I didn't punch mean... me in the jaw. Okay, I'm sorry I hit you. I did mean to hit you, but it was in, res in response. I just reacted in response to my foot. I just reacted. 
The cross-examination ending with questions about Heard's ex, Tazia Van Rie, and allegations of abuse in that relationship and an effort to show a pattern of Heard being the aggressor. So Mr. Depp is not the only domestic partner you've assaulted, is he, Ms. Heard? I've never assaulted Mr. Depp or anyone else that I've been romantically linked to, ever. Heard insists that the 2018 Washington Post op-ed she penned labeling herself a public figure representing domestic abuse had nothing to do with Depp. This is about Mr. Depp, isn't it? No, so it's not about May Johnny. To, it's Ms. about Heard, what happened to me Ms. after. Heard, it's that very op-ed that Depp is suing Heard over for $50 million, saying the implications that it was about him were clear despite never naming him claiming it cost the 58-year-old movie roles, despite his insistence he never physically hurt her. 38-year-old Heard countersuing Depp for $100 million for calling her a liar and claiming Depp's team orchestrated an ongoing smear campaign against her. Closing arguments are set for May 27th. Our thanks to Janae for that. Still to come, the votes are starting to trickle in where things stand as of this hour with today's primary election. Stay with us. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. We know who we are, where we come from, and where we belong. This is the story of how we live, how we survive for thousands of years. We're still maintaining our culture and we're fighting for it, generation after generation. It's important to pass these skills on. We make it work out here. Something very beautiful about it. I'm hearing a cat. Hello? Honey, I don't think it speaks English. <laughs> for this dynamic duo, Where's this thing been all my life? <laughs> Passion. She figured it out. This is awesome. Is in everything they do. There's a horse accident. I don't think he broke a bone down here. Thank goodness for that. Cat squats? Up, down. You have to go lower. <laughs> oh, sorry. Heartland Docks. New season Saturday at 10 on Nat Geo Wild. You know the music and what it means. Your votes, your vote. Welcome back, and thanks so much for streaming with us. Voters in five states have been making their voices heard throughout the country, and we're starting to see those election results trickling in. The biggest prize, arguably, of the night has been the fight playing out in both parties over who will face off to become the next senator of Pennsylvania. So many watching the three-way battle in Pennsylvania playing out between TV personality Dr. Mehmet Oz, backed by former President Trump, establishment pick Dave McCormick, and hard right candidate Kathy Barnett, who's been surging in recent days. Right now, let's take a look at what the polls show. Dave McCormick leading 33%, Mehmet Oz 22%, Kathy Barnett close behind with 20% there. Meanwhile, on the Democratic side, frontrunner Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman had a pacemaker installed tonight after he announced that he had a stroke on Friday. Here's where that race stands at this hour. He is still 
taking the lead despite that operation over the weekend. 52% of the lead there, 32% to Connor Lamb and Malcolm Kenyatta with 11%. So now let's bring in ABC Deputy Director Avery Harper. Pennsylvania votes starting to come in there. Same for North Carolina, another major battleground state, of course. Yeah, this comes as there are contentious House races that could be emblematic of the which way the Democratic Party goes. The same is also true, of course, for the Republican Party, with the extremes really on both sides angling for more power. Uh, what are you tracking in particular tonight, Avery? Right. I think well, there has been a much made a, a, about the uh, GOP races that are going on tonight. I am particularly interested in looking at some of the Democratic races that we have uh, on the House side. Uh, there are a lot of really interesting races to watch, uh, particularly in some reliably blue areas. Uh, we have uh, progressive heavyweights, folks like uh, Senator Bernie Sen Sanders, Senator Elizabeth Warren, members of the squad weighing in for progressive candidates aiming to get some wins on the board tonight. Uh, but on the other side of the the, uh, political spectrum, even within the Democratic Party, you have uh, some of these moderate candidates who are being backed and supported uh, by some outside groups, some super PACs who are pouring millions of dollars uh, into some of these races. Uh, and uh, still, uh, we are going to be looking at what's uh, going to be going on. A lot of that vote is still out in, in some of these races. We're talking about races in uh, Pennsylvania, in Oregon, in North Carolina. Uh, some of these areas are, are battlegrounds and areas areas where uh, progressives are really aiming to pick up some wins. Uh, and it could be really emblematic of the direction of the Democratic Party uh, in November and uh, even looking ahead to 2024. And Avery, if there is one thing that all voters should be mindful of tonight as they're watching our coverage, as the numbers start to come in in terms of how tonight plays into November and the balance of power in Congress, what would that be? Right. I, I mentioned some of the Democratic races, but now I'll talk about Republicans. I think it's really uh, important to look at some of those candidates who espouse the big lie. Uh, folks like in, in Pennsylvania, like Doug Mastriano, like Kathy Barnett, if they are folks who are uh, on the ticket in the general election in November, uh, they are not going to just be uh, appealing to uh, Republicans who are voting in these primary races. They're going to have to appeal to independents, uh, appeal to Democrats maybe who might be dissatisfied uh, with the direction of the Biden administration, and that's going to be a tougher task. As you said, Mastriano and Barnett, both president in D.C. Uh, on January 6th. Avery Harper, our thanks to you. We'll bring you back in just a moment. But first, uh, let's talk to 538 elections analyst Jeffrey Skelly, who's monitoring a few other key races tonight. Uh, Jeffrey, thanks for joining us. You're keeping an eye, of course, on the Pennsylvania governor's race, the front runner there, State Senator Doug Mastriano. Uh, uh, what are you watching for there? Sure. I mean, I think a big thing is that coming into uh, tonight's contest, uh, Mastriano was leading uh, in pretty much all the polling that we saw. Um, now, but he didn't have a huge percentage. And so we also had uh, former President Donald Trump endorse Mastriano right here at the end of the race. So I'm very interested to see if Mastriano ends up with, if, if the early numbers continue to show him sort of running a bit lower than maybe we expected, and maybe he's only in the in the high 20s, or does he get a bit of a bump out of that endorsement? Is he in the mid 30s or 40 percent at the end of the night? Um, but I do think he is the favorite, though we don't have a lot of votes yet. And in North Carolina, you've been watching the Senate GOP race where ABC News has projected Ted Budd will win that race on the Republican side. What factors were playing that race? Well, I think a, a real obvious thing to point to uh, is former President Trump endorsed Bud when Bud was not really all that well known in North Carolina. And, he, and Bud was facing uh, former Governor Pat McCrory uh, in this contest as the other notable candidate. But it looks like Bud has, has won rather easily. And I think another big thing to keep in mind is that Bud had a ton of outside help um, from the conservative Club for Growth, which spent millions running ads on his behalf. And so I think, you know, those factors together ended up really boosting Bud's campaign. All right, Jeffrey Skelly from 538, thank you so much for your insight. And now let's go next to ABC News correspondent Alex Perche inside the campaign headquarters of Dr. Mehmet Oz. Alex, uh, Dr. Oz got that highly coveted Trump endorsement, but it doesn't seem like that was enough to, to really overwhelmingly convince Pennsylvania Republicans to back him. And as we're watching the results play out tonight, uh, maybe not even as tight of a race as, as many of us thought. Give us a sense of, of what you're getting from, their from his campaign. 
Well, there is an air of confidence here, and things are just getting underway here at this watch party. But, Lindsay, as you mentioned, in a very crowded Republican field, uh, Dr. Oz managed to get that coveted cosign, right, the endorsement of former President Trump. And cer certainly it, it boosted him in the polls. But the other thing that it did, it, it, it put a target on his back, especially whenever you consider that a lot of people in this field have similar political ideologies. And, and so, you know, there's that old uh, Ronald Reagan adage uh, uh, saying that thou shall not talk ill, speak ill of any other uh, Republican. Well, certainly that's kind of shifted since 2016. But in the waning days of this campaign, we've seen a lot of personal attacks. And today, uh, Dr. Oz punching back specifically against uh, Kathy Barnett, who has been surging the polls, telling our Rachel Scott earlier that he believes that she has had her day in the sun. He's also doubled down, uh, saying that he's proud to have President Trump's endorsement. Uh, and also, he made the case that he believes that he is the best positioned Republican to actually defeat the Democrat come November. Kathy Barnett obviously angling to be only the third black female senator in the country's history. Alex Prashay, thank you so much. We'll check back in with you in just a moment. We'll be right back in a moment with more election coverage as the votes continue to trickle in throughout the night. Stay with us. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. We know who we are, where we come from, and where we belong. This is the story of how we live how we survived for thousands of years. We're still maintaining our culture. We're fighting for it, generation after generation. It's important to pass these skills on. We make it work out here. Something very beautiful about it. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Lots of excitement tonight. We have some real nail biters we are watching. And now let's bring in ABC News contributor, former North Dakota Senator Heidi Heitkamp. Heidi, thank you so much for joining us as always. So the votes are still coming in, but, but let's talk about Pennsylvania Senate race for a moment. Going into today on the Republican side, you had a hedge fund CEO going up against a celebrity physician and another candidate who may have gone to the Capitol grounds on January 6th. The winner of that race is expected to go up against a Democrat who's recovering from a stroke and today had a pacemaker put in. Personal challenges really don't appear to dissuade voters these days, but what do you think will move the needle in particular with voters during these polarized times? 
Well, I, I tell you, um, you look at Tim Ryan in Ohio, you look at Fetterman in Pennsylvania, these are two candidates that exude blue collar, exude the old Democratic base. And I think it is a smart decision on the part of um, Democratic primary voters in those two states. And um, they're up against uh, two candidates um, I don't care who wins the Pennsylvania primary, two candidates who have one qualification. They want to relitigate the grievances of Donald Trump. And I couldn't agree with Mark Short more. He did such a great job in your previous segment, Lindsay, saying basically when all you're doing is talking about Donald Trump, you're not explaining who you are. And I think that um, Dr. Oz is, if he prevails, he's going to prevail as a Trump candidate. Um, I think that it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by what's happening in Pennsylvania. You have a traditional, you know, government, uh, uh, you know, uh, a small government, uh, chamber of commerce candidate, hedge fund manager. You have kind of this new upstart. And then you have kind of a new Republican. Um, whether I would agree with her or not, I think that she has the look that the Republican Party would want to advance. I'm not sure she's going to make it tonight, but it's it's, it's a fascinating um, uh, debate. It's a fascinating challenge. But I tell you, I'm more excited about our two candidates, both Tim Ryan and Fetterman, um, and our candidate that's going to emerge out of uh, North Carolina. Um, I think uh, this is going to be a good year for our Senate candidates if we continue to see these kinds of races shaping up this way. Right. You talk about Fetterman being blue collar, though also a Harvard grad. And many people talk about how he's able to be so attractive to different people uh, across the spectrum. We mentioned Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, who's expected to win tonight. He's a progressive, but, but looks like he could have real crossover appeal in November. Is he the type of candidate that Democrats need to see more of on the national stage? No, oh, I, I totally agree. Somebody who looks like the people that they represent, somebody people can identify with, that old blue collar base of the Democratic Party that's left us, that left us for Donald Trump. We need to win some of those votes back, especially in rural America, which is a challenge that I've taken on. And, and he and Tim Ryan, and I don't think you can, can ignore the fact that we are nominating candidates that look like their states, look like the old Democratic base. And tonight's elections may also help us begin to really assess where the Democratic Party may be heading and if progressives can gain any ground. How do you see that dynamic playing out with moderates still holding a fairly tight grip on the party leadership right now? Again, going back to Ohio, Lindsay, we had a race again for the old Martha Fudge district in Cleveland, um, where the progressive is again, uh, the Justice Democrats again put up a candidate and lost handedly. Um, you're seeing this play out in Oregon. You saw in a re previous segment the discussion about whether the progressive candidates can win in some of these less progressive districts. And I think it's going to be a heavy lift. I think that Democratic primary voters are saying our most important thing is winning. We want to win, we want to nominate candidates we think can win, candidates that have crossover appeal, especially in these tough districts. All right. Former Senator Heidi Heidkamp, we thank you so much for your time and insight as always. Thanks, Lindsay. And now let's bring in ABC News contributor and former Republican member of Congress, Barbara Comstock. Uh, uh, Barbara, just curious what you're watching in particular tonight. Well, I've been watching the Madison Cawthorn race because that is something where I think you really saw Republican leadership from Senator Tom Tillis, who endorsed his opponent, Madison Cawthorn's opponent. And with the early vote in, um, his opponent, who's a state senator, um, Edwards, is leading, but that could be um, very close. But I think we need to see more Republicans do what Senator Tillis did, which was be courageous enough to go up against a Trump-endorsed candidate. We saw last week in Nebraska that uh, Governor um, Ricketts in Nebraska endorsed a candidate different than Donald Trump and survived. So um, certainly, like everybody else, I'm watching the Pennsylvania race, but I think that has become such a race to the bottom on who can be Trumpier, as was discussed you know, with our previous guest, I think um, you know, they, they're making the race easier for Democrats because instead of focusing on the economy 
gas and groceries, the cratering sort of disaster that is the Biden administration. They're focused on the cratering disaster that is Donald Trump in the past. And if you want to win elections, you focus on your voters, your constituents and the future. And let's talk about the big lie candidates. We know that you've been forcefully fighting for the officers and their families after January 6th. How big of an issue is it, do you think, that, that so many Republican candidates are, are now openly touting the big lie? Uh, it's a real problem. And again, when they are focusing on that 2020 election and just trying to make Donald Trump happy, they're not going to make voters happy because voters are really hurting with groceries, um, you know, skyrocketing the cost and the price of gas may go up to $6 a gallon, it was said. And those are such easy kitchen table issues to focus on. Yet you have Donald Trump demanding that these sycophants go along with him. So I think it's a big problem. It's, it's not just bad politics. It is very bad for our democracy and it's bad policy overall, which is why I'm supporting it. But I think it also, you know, bad policy is bad politics. And it's, it's very problematic. And in a year where Republicans can win, I am, you know, and I, I think right now many Republicans think they don't care what kind of doofus gets the nomination. They think they'll win anyway, say in a state like North Carolina or, um, you know, red states. But as we've seen before, even in a state, say, like, you know, Alabama, where uh, you know, we lost a Senate seat there while Donald Trump was in office, you can lose a seat if you have a really bad candidate. So in a good year, it would be nice to have good candidates, which is what I've been focused on, good Republican candidates who are focused on the future not Donald Trump and his grievances. And many in Republican circles have been speculating that in states like Pennsylvania, primary voters might end up voting for people so extreme that then they don't have a chance in November. Do you share that concern, even given higher Republican enthusiasm for their party compared to, to many Democrats right now? Oh, sure. I'm very concerned about um, the governor candidate in Pennsylvania, Mastri Mastriano, I believe his name is, who was, yes. you know, one of the insurrectionists who was down on January 6th. Uh, and I think t the idea of having him as governor is very troubling. I think that's why you're already seeing Republicans saying they would support Josh Shapiro, the Democrat, if, um, if Mastriano was to win. Um, the election, and certainly the surge, you know, the surging campaign of of Kathy Barnett, but as well as you know, I mean, the other candidates are all you know just been trying to suck up. I'm more Trumpy. I'm more Trumpy, and that's not been a you know at a time again when you need to be focused on the kitchen table issues. If the Democrat candidates can be disciplined enough to do that, and maybe even separate from their party and do what, say, what Bill, when Bill Clinton used to triangulate and focus on the voters and not trying to make the far left happy, that would be the thing to do in Pennsylvania. But the Democrats, I think, have had a real problem going too far left. So it leaves people in the middle. Like I, I have uh, family and friends in Pennsylvania, and I know, you know they won't be supporting somebody like Dr. Oz or Mastriano or Kathy Barnett. So if these are the nominees, I think you're going to lose a lot of Republicans in the suburbs, certainly, you know, when you look at Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, you could um, be losing what would traditionally be Republican voters and people who want to vote Republican in a year where we are really suffering from the bad Democratic policies, but people who still care about the Constitution, the truth, and not, um, you know, following this big lie, which is very, very destructive to our democracy and to uh, certainly, whether it's to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania or the Commonwealth of Virginia or anywhere across the country. Barbara Comstock, always good to have you on. Appreciate your time and insight. And now we want to give you some breaking news. ABC News now projects John Fetterman, all six foot nine of them in his hoodie and tattoos. Pennsylvanians have chosen him on the Democratic ticket for the Pennsylvania Senate tonight. This despite the fact that he had a stroke on Friday and just underwent surgery to get a pacemaker put in tonight. He actually voted uh, by emergency absentee ballot from his hospital bed tonight. Pennsylvania's residents going for John Fetterman tonight. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Of course, our election primary coverage continues tonight. For now, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us.
deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. We move up to the vehicle. He detonates the bomb. The heroes who stopped the killer, who held the city of Austin hostage for 19 days. It's a tripwire. All hands on deck. The clues, the Home Depot video, that truck, and the agent who connected the dots. It was exactly the vehicle that we were looking for. Inside the investigation. Vans made contact. The takedown of the bomber. Now streaming on Hulu. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you an IT? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put people to your life like this. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. States, five primary elections, dozens of high stakes races. I felt he, you know, definitely has Pennsylvania's people at heart, and that was important to me. I, I actually had to take a little bit of time off from work to vote because it's important that everybody get and vote. In particular, the last couple of years, it's become really ugly. So if you're not counted, you're in trouble. From Pennsylvania, where the GOP race for Senate has the party at odds. I just cast the vote for myself which is not a humble thing to do, but it's what I'm humbling asking all Pennsylvanians to do. Well, voters cast their ballot for a celebrity physician turned Trump and Dorsey, a far-right Republican, or a conservative businessman. No one knows the, the issues and the people of Pennsylvania like I do. The Democratic race marred by health issues. The candidate with a healthy lead casting his vote from a hospital bed today. And to North Carolina, after a series of missteps, will Republican Congressman Madison Cawthorn hold on to his seat? And a former American Idol contestant looking to join Congress. Tonight, ABC News Live brings you full context and analysis. Once again, we say good evening to you. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Voters across the country took to the polls with one of America's most divisive issues front and center during the last closely watched contest. It was, of course, that bombshell Supreme Court memo leak over abortion. Now it's the scourge of gun violence in America after yet another mass shooting. This one, according to officials, inspired by hate. Sadly, that type of violence is familiar to the American voter. Yet the biggest storyline that could play out tonight as results continue to come in could be how will voters treat the rise of the big lie and extremist candidates and whether or not former President Trump's apparent firm grip on the Republican Party will ultimately result in wins or embarrassing losses come November. So what's at stake? Consequential midterm primaries are playing out in five states. Polls now closed in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Kentucky, Idaho, and Oregon residents, though, are still making their voices heard. We should learn a great deal about the direction of the Republican and Democratic Party by the end of the night. And, and uh, you heard me mention abortion and gun violence. But when our friends at 538 asked Americans what their biggest concern is right now, the resounding answer was inflation. And that could signal some very bad news for Democrats. We have lots to get to on yet another big election night here on ABC News Live. But let's start right now with what may ultimately be the most closely watched and expensive battle this entire election season, talking about the battle over who could end up as the next senator of Pennsylvania. Take a look here. You have John Fetterman, ABC's projecting him to win there with 
56 uh, percent of the vote. That's only 25 percent of expected votes reporting so far. Um, but also you have John Fetterman has been leading the polls for a while, but then his campaign announced that he suffered a health scare. Of course, he had that stroke this past Friday, just had the surgery um, tonight to put that pacemaker in. Now let's bring back in our senior Washington correspondent, Devin Dwyer, at Fetterman campaign headquarters. Uh, Devin, it would appear that that health scare really didn't scare away voters there. It sure didn't, Lindsay. You know, I spent all afternoon talking to voters. They were really unfazed. Uh, and it's a testament to the staying power of Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman's story and his style in this race. The voters here in Pennsylvania, Democrats, have gone with the unconventional candidate. John Fetterman uh, is, is an anti-establishment candidate, 52 years old, father of three, former mayor of a majority black city. A son of teenage parents who are conservative Republicans, uh, a fascinating story, went to college here in Pennsylvania, but got a master's in public policy from Harvard. He certainly doesn't look the part, as you know, wears Dickies and Carhartt on the trail. Gym shorts are the fixture of his fashion wardrobe. Uh, but tonight he has seized the Democratic nomination uh, with resounding force. And Democrats here in the state of Pennsylvania are excited. This is a critical race, as you said at the top, uh, in their bid to win control. Uh, hold control of the United States Senate in 2023 and pick up a seat from Republicans. This is an open seat. This is their best chance to take one back. Uh, and the crowd behind me here already celebrating tonight. Uh, we don't expect to see, uh, of course, John Fetterman. He's still in the hospital, had surgery just a few hours ago, Lindsay, as you said, a new pacemaker and defibrillator. Uh, so those health concerns are hanging over all of this. They will want a healthy candidate to go up against whoever Republicans pick tonight. But certainly uh, a lot of excitement now for Democrats as the race on their side is set for one of the most critical midterm primary battles ahead, Lindsay. And Dave, Devin, uh, of course, Fetterman moves ahead to a general election in this key swing state. It's a seat that the Democrats really are hoping to pick up from the GOP this fall. Yeah, you heard Heidi Heitkamp talk about it. They are hoping uh, to make inroads in those heavily Trump areas, those red counties, not to win them outright, but to uh, cut into Republican margins. And that's something that John Fetterman talks about a lot. He, his slogan in this campaign, Lindsay, was every vote, every county, showing up matters, authenticity matters, being sort of the everyman, if you will, matters. And that's his strategy uh, for this campaign. You know, he calls himself or he eschews the label progressive, even though a lot of his policies are progressive, but he doesn't fit in an easy box. He's someone who supports legalization of marijuana, $15 minimum wage, expanding health care access uh, for people, but at the same time, very moderate positions when it comes to guns. He's a gun owner himself, a moderate position when it comes to fracking and environmental policy. Those sorts of positions play much better in rural areas in this state. So an unconventional candidate has won here tonight, Lindsay, uh, and as Heidi and other Democrats have talked about, uh, uh, they're hoping this could be a blueprint for them to win in other parts of the country that are contested as well. Of course, he also wants to legalize marijuana, make the minimum wage $15. It'd be very interesting to see how this all plays out come November. Devin, our thanks to you. Of course, we'll be checking back in with you. Uh, for a while, it really seemed like this, this race seemed like a two-man battle between TV personality Dr. Mehmet Oz, backed by former President Trump, and establishment pick Dave McCormick. But in the final days of campaigning, polls showed that it became a three-way battle with hard-right candidate Kathy Barnett surging. And here is where things stand at this hour. Uh, Dave McCormick, 32 percent of the vote, and then Mehmet Oz in second place, Kathy Barnett trailing uh, with 21 percent of the vote to uh, Dr. Oz is 26 percent. Let's bring back in ABC's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott, who's reporting from Philadelphia. And, and once again, Rachel, uh, former President Trump backed celebrity physician Dr. Mehmet Oz, but, but uh, let's say it, in Ohio that hasn't appeared uh, to have moved enough Republicans it, as it did in Ohio, it seemed to work there. We're not really clear that it's really working uh, in Pennsylvania as the race remains uh, rather competitive, but he's still in second place. Uh, talk to us about the dynamics that have been playing out in the Keystone State. 
Well, Lindsay, I could tell you that Trump's endorsement was really the golden ticket in this race. It's something that every single candidate wanted. Only one got it. Obviously, Dr. Mehmet Oz, Trump throwing his support behind him. And that really upended a lot of this race for uh, the other two candidates here. You have David McCormick, who has uh, his own wife, used to work for former President Donald Trump. He has Hope Hicks, another uh, former Trump aide, working on his campaign as well. He was really gunning for that endorsement, as well as Kathy Barnett, a far-right conservative commentator, as she was hoping that the Trump endorsement would be hers. Obviously, it went to Dr. Oz. Now, the question is whether or not it is going to pay off in this race. Part of that's something that's really interesting here and something that I'm really looking to see tonight is where this really tips, because so many voters that I talked to just at Dr. Oz's event last night were completely undecided. And Kathy Barnett's surge in the final days of this race has really thrown another curveball uh, in this race uh, on whether or not she was going to pull through. Many voters I talked to last night said that they were torn between Dr. Oz and torn between Kathy Barnett. They liked her, but they questioned whether or not she was ready for the job, whether or not she had enough experience. Electability is something that was really important to these voters because they know Democrats will be zeroing in on this come November. And staying with that point, Rachel, of course, you're in deep blue Philadelphia, a city surrounded by many moderate Republicans. There have been concerns from Republicans in recent weeks that the Senate race there could end in someone being nominated who just wouldn't be electable statewide. What have you been hearing about that? Exactly, because as you just heard from Devin, Democrats really see this as their best chance nationwide to really flip a seat in the Senate. They see this as a big opportunity. And so going forward here, we're going to see a lot of money pour into this state. It's already become one of the most expensive primaries in the nation. That is going to continue because Democrats are laser focused on winning this state and hopefully retaining for them a control of both the House and the Senate. Now, for Republicans here, they want the strongest candidate going up against the Democrats. And that's something that we repeatedly heard from former President Donald Trump. He actually called into Dr. Oz's event uh, last night, and he said that he believes that Dr. Oz is the best candidate to defeat a Democrat in November. That is the message that he wanted voters, especially those undecided voters, to take home as they headed to the polls earlier today. And some voters that we did speak with said that that made the difference, that Trump thinks that Dr. Oz could pull this out and turn out a victory for Republicans. Well, they're going with Dr. Oz. But again, remains to be seen on whether or not he's going to bring home that win tonight, Lindsay. Remains to be seen. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. And switching battlegrounds, now let's take a look at the contest playing out in North Carolina. Senate first on the Democratic side. Uh, there you have Sherry Beasley. ABC News has projected that Sherry Beasley will win that race and move on to the November general election. Meanwhile, on the Republican side, ABC News has projected Ted Budd will win the North Carolina GOP Senate primary. There were more than 10 candidates in this race, but Bud, a Trump-endorsed candidate, managed to come out on top, winning by a fairly large uh, margin so far with 45 percent of the votes reporting. Uh, so let's keep the conversation going about North Carolina in this hour, the other major battleground state where voters headed to the polls today. Let's bring in anchor Dewan Hogard from ABC station WTVD in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hey, thanks so much for joining us, Dewan. Uh, one of the storylines many are tracking tonight is what Republican voters will do about freshman Republican Madison Cawthorn. To say he is no stranger to controversy is an understatement. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, how the uproar has played to voters? Well, Lindsay, uh, good evening to you. First off, thanks so much for having me on. Now, Madison Cawthorn, uh, as we said, no stranger to controversy. Even if you just date back two months ago when we're sitting in the middle of March, he makes national headlines by referring to Ukrainian pre uh, President uh, Vladimir Zelensky as a thug. Fast forward one more month, he's caught in a North Carolina airport smuggling a loaded gun. Then not even a month after that, we're in the month of May, early part of May. Then there's that disturbing video that comes up of which he refers to himself as being crass, uh, seen in a video with his apparent cousin or a friend of sorts. So no stranger to controversy there. Now we're wondering if voters, if that's going to be something that was on their mind heading into today. Now, earlier, I spoke with a couple of voters at a polling place and one gentleman telling me specifically in that crowded field of folks to choose from, he's simply going with a Trump backed candidate. Now, exactly how is that going to play out for Madison Cawthorn tonight? We're continuing to watch those results with just over 35 percent of precincts reporting. Madison Cawthorn is trailing by just about three points or so. But over the last 10 minutes or so, I've watched that uh, that lead that Chuck Edwards had, who only spent 800 
$100, so to speak, raise that, that is heading into the month of May. Uh, that lead has since uh, decreased over the last couple of minutes. So we're going to continue to watch that, Lindsay, as the evening progresses to see if Madison Cawthorn, despite his troubles, will be the victory, uh, will be a victor, that is, after tonight. Yeah, we can presume that uh, former President Donald Trump, when he introduced him the other night, was saying, oh, this guy doesn't have any controversy at all. He doesn't know uh, controversy at all. But let's move now. We, we just saw the results in that Senate race from both parties. Representative Ted Budd was backed by Trump, which was significant because he was up against a former North Carolina governor. Tell us about that race and, and what the November matchup looks like. Well, first things first, if your name is former Governor Pat McCrory, you've really got to be kicking yourself as to what you did wrong. Now, early on in the polls, former Governor McCrory, he had a double-digit lead over Ted Budd here in this race. So if you're McCrory, you're feeling actually relatively pretty good. Then uh, Trump comes into the state, endorses Ted Budd. Then you see those numbers flip-flop. Budd then leading with a double-digit lead. McCrory still in the race. And then you have a third candidate by the name of Mark Walker. Now, Trump did approach Mark Walker and encouraged him to leave that race altogether. Walker refusing so, staying in the race. But tonight, uh, we're finding, as, as we just mentioned moments ago, ABC News projecting Ted Budd to be that winner. So obviously, uh, that Trump factor, that Trump endorsement is certainly one that Ted Budd uh, welcomed. If you're McCrory, now you're figuring out what to do next with your political career. But there was a guy who had somewhat a, of a backing. You had the, the Budd campaign talking about Pat McCrory with uh, the millions of dollars of ads being pushed against McCrory saying that he was too liberal of sorts uh, when in fact his governorship was anything but that. Uh, so if you're Ted Budd, you are smiling into the evening, you're preparing uh, for a, a very heated race against Sherry Beasley, who if she wins in November will be the uh, only black woman in the Senate. All right, Dewan Hogard, we thank you so much for your insight. Appreciate it. Now let's bring in ABC News political director Rick Klein. Rick, let's break down what we're seeing on the vote coming in from Pennsylvania tonight. What's standing out to you so far tonight? Yeah, taking a look at how John Fetterman uh, is winning and ABC News is project, projecting that he is en route to, to victory and winning the nomination, it is a fascinating cross-section of Democratic voters, and it's exactly why people like Heidi Heitkamp and others in the Democratic Party seem to be excited about John Fetterman. Uh, starting in his home county right here in the Pittsburgh area, Allegheny County, he's winning by about a two-to-one margin right there, even though one of the other candidates in the race, uh, Connor Lamb, is also from the same part of the state. Uh, but beyond that, he's winning just about everywhere. In fact, the only place that he's not winning right now is there in the city of Philadelphia where there's a state representative who's also in the race. But that's the only place that Malcolm Kenyatta is winning. Everywhere else, it's all Fetterman. And that includes in some of the, the key counties that went for Barack Obama and then went for Donald Trump. Uh, they were so critical in the 2020 election, critical again this year. In Northampton County right here, Fetterman, 60 percent of the vote, 70 percent in Luzerne County. That's a place where Democrats have lost so much ground over the last couple of decades. They desperately need to win that back. And really, the whole middle of the state, all of these counties here, a couple of blue ones and a whole sea of red, that's Fetterman territory. He has made a case traveling around the state that he is the right kind of Democrat for Democrats that haven't won in a while, haven't seen a candidate maybe that they want to support. So it is going to be a, a decisive victory by John Fetterman, despite the fact that he spent the last couple days in the hospital, uh, despite the fact that uh, he, he ran a distant third when he ran for Senate back in 2016. He is triumphant tonight, and he is a big star in the Democratic Party from this day forward. And we're seeing some concerns over some of Trump's endorsements in key races where he's backed far-right election deniers. Walk us through what's at stake on that front tonight and also going forward. Yeah, I think I think the, the key thing to keep in mind when you've got a, a Donald Trump endorsement is that usually he preconditions that on some degree of election denial. And there's people that run the gamut on it. There are people like uh, like uh, Doug Mastriano, the, his choice in the Pennsylvania governor's race, who was at the January 6th rally and then uh, led the legal efforts in the state Senate to try to overturn the election. There's others like Dr. Oz who've been a little more circumspect on it. Uh, he has made clear that he does believe that, that Biden was rightfully elected, but he also says we have to continue to look back to be able to learn lessons moving forward. Similarly, Ted Budd, his, his, uh, his choice in North Carolina, who won the nomination tonight, uh, really not in the camp of the outright election deniers. But it is critical, particularly that, that, that Pennsylvania governor's race. The governor of Pennsylvania, Lindsay, gets to name the secretary of state. So that means if, if State Senator Mastriano becomes Governor Mastriano in the fall, if he wins the nomination and goes on, he gets to pick the person who's in charge of the next election. And we know what he says about the last election and the way that he has continued to, to, to 
buy into uh, the falsehoods that Donald Trump has put out there. Which is super significant. Who gets to pick that next Secretary of State? Rick Klein, thank you so much. Again, we'll be joining you throughout the night. Now to races in Kentucky. Incumbent Senator Rand Paul seeking a third term in the U.S. Senate. And ABC News has projected that he will win the nomination for GOP Senate primary. Take a look. 87% of the vote, not even close at all, with 74% of the vote reporting there. And for the Democrats, ABC News projects former state representative Charles Booker will clinch the nomination. Booker made a run for Senate in 2020, but he ended up losing to the candidate who lost in the general to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Senator Paul is heavily favored to hold on to that Kentucky seat. Charles Booker with 73% of the vote, with 87% of the voters reporting there. And let's turn now to our partners at 538 and bring in elections analyst Jeffrey Skelly back in. So Jeffrey, 538 will be conducting a series of polls through November with Ipsos surveying a group of 2,000 Americans on the biggest concerns heading into November. And the first results are out today. What did they find? So our first poll with Ipsos found that 52% of Americans said that the most important issue facing the country uh, was inflation and increasing costs. Um, and, you know, that was a finding that was across the board. Um, two thirds of Republicans said this, about half of independents said it, and just a little over 40% of Democrats. And of all the other issues we asked about, no other uh, issue ranked as highly for, for any party. Um, so inflation was number one. And, and, you know, it's something that I think we knew that from other polling, but, you know, our poll was seeking to find out a bit more about that. Um, so we asked them a lot of questions about inflation too. And what specifically are voters saying about inflation and how that's impacting their lives right now? Yeah, so, you know, we heard a lot of, uh, you know, frankly, really difficult things to hear um, in some of the open-ended questions that we asked um, respondents. Um, they talked about not being able to buy uh, as much food as they used to at the grocery store, even going to the grocery store less, skipping meals even. I mean, this is some really, uh, you know, uh, difficult things um, to hear. The American people are struggling with this. Um, and there were other things, of course, uh, struggling to pay rent. Um, and a big one, of course, was concern about gas prices. You know, in this country, a lot of people drive to work. A lot of people spend a lot of time on the road um, for work, for business, um, even for pleasure. People talked about taking less vacations with their kids um, because it's just so expensive right now um, to drive anywhere. So that, you know, that was a, clearly a large pain for, for Americans responding to this poll. 538 Elections Analyst Jeffrey Skelly, thank you again. We so appreciate it. Last week, it was abortion. This week, gun control. Inflation, though, as you just heard, still front and center on many voters' minds. Let's talk about it all with ABC News contributor, former DNC chair and Democratic strategist, Ms. Donna Brazil, and legislative affairs director to former President Trump, who was also the former chief of staff to Vice President Pence, Mr. Mark Short. Thank you so much for both of you joining us tonight. Donna, let's start with you. Uh, President Biden today said, quote, that white supremacy is poison in response to the horrific attack in Buffalo and called on Americans to take on the haters and reject the lie of racial replacement that allegedly uh, may have inspired that young man to, to go down, uh, to gun down black shoppers in Buffalo. Uh, there haven't been many, if any, Republicans nearly as forceful as President Biden. Is that because messages like what we heard the president say today uh, just don't motivate voters straight across the board in this country? Well, we did hear from, as you know, Liz Cheney yesterday, who I thought was very um, strong and denouncing white supremacy and basically challenging those in her own party the way we have to often challenge people in our party to do better, uh, to denounce this form of hate. Look, we know now that uh, black Americans have uh, faced horrific attacks. Uh, these attacks are not uh, things that we're talking about that occurred 20 years ago or 200 years ago. They're happening now. So it's important that we not only uh, call it poisonous, but it's also deadly. White supremacy, this replacement theory, this is deadly stuff. This is, you know, capturing the, the, the young minds and, and, and perhaps even older minds of Americans who should know better. Uh, that there's no such thing as, as a replacement theory. We are Americans. Who are we replacing? We are Americans. So I thought the president was strong, but there are Republicans speaking out. And that's important that we speak out because we have 10 souls. 10 souls are dead. We have families who are mourning, communities that are afraid and fearful of the future. So I'm glad the president 
took the first step in denouncing it, calling it poisonous. But I'm saying as someone who uh, has seen this violence and has heard these, what, uh, what I call conspiracy theory, take down people from Charlottesville, uh, take down people in Sh Charleston, and take down people at a Jewish synagogue and a Christian church and at Walmart in El Paso because they're Hispanics. Uh, so it's time that we call less in, as Americans and denounce any form of discrimination, all forms of hatred, and to make sure that our leaders, not just our political leaders, our public figures, but everybody, including people in the media, it's time for everybody to take a look in the mirror. And, and Donna and Mark, if you can just stand by with us for a moment, because we do want to return our viewers to the Fetterman headquarters where his wife, Giselle, is now speaking. Again, ABC News has projected him as a winner on the Democratic <laughs> ticket, Pennsylvania has Senate. been hard on him. Back on Friday, I noticed something was off. He didn't even want to go to the hospital. He didn't want to miss the events we had planned. But I insisted, and as usual, I was right. <laughs> and I'm so glad I made him go for two reasons. The first is that doctors were able to act quickly, and John is going to be back on his feet in no time. And the second reason is that I now have one more thing I get to hold over him. I mean, I saved his life, right? I will never let him live that down. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Giselle Bajeta Fetterman, the second lady of Pennsylvania. <laughs> or as I like to call it, slop. <laughs> I met John many years, three kids and two dogs ago, before he was Pennsylvania's next senator. Back then, he was just a guy trying to pour love into Braddock, a small steel town that helped build America and had been left behind. He moved there to teach GB classes, and after two of his students were gunned down, he ran for mayor to stop the violence, bring back jobs, and bring hope. I read about the work John was doing, and I was inspired. Long story short, I joined him in Braddock. He, of course, fell madly in love with me. <laughs> we got married, and we've been working together ever since to make sure that no one is left behind. But really, though, <laughs> I immigrated to this country with my mom, who is here. Say hi, Mom. here when I was just a kid. I was a dreamer. And when our son August heard that, he asked me, Mommy, what did you dream about? And I told him I dreamt about him, and that was true. But also I dreamt about all of this. Like so many others, I found the American dream and made my life here in Western Pennsylvania. I found love, a wonderful family, and a place I am proud to raise my children. John and I want to make sure that everyone in Pennsylvania can find the American dream here, too. On the surface, John and I don't seem like we'd have a lot in common. Funny enough, according to the Zodiac, we are only 11% compatible. <laughs> of course, I checked, because I want to make sure. <laughs> but what connected us then and what connects us now is a shared conviction. No person should be left behind, and no community should be forgotten. John has always stood out. My grandmother, B.B., who we recently lost, used to say he had to be made that tall because it was the only way to fit his whole heart. <laughs> but it's not just his height or his goatee, his refusal to wear long pants. <laughs> Even when I beg him, then make him different. It's not just that John looks nothing like a politician and is deliriously handsome. <laughs> it's because John doesn't act like one. At heart, he's still that hardworking, scrappy, small-town mayor. He wants to know the people he's serving. He feels a responsibility to each and every one of them. And he fights for people like he'd fight for a neighbor, like he'd fight for his family. That is what makes John different. And that is what makes him tough enough to fight for Pennsylvania. He did it in Braddock. He did it in Harrisburg. And now he's going to do the same thing in Washington. Now, I'm going to be honest 
with you. Politics is mean. And yes! And I am not. <laughs> but the truth is, too many people in this commonwealth and in this country are hurting. Too many people feel abandoned, feel ignored. Too many people think their best days are behind them. And nothing is more cruel than the feeling of hopelessness. But John has a plan and a purpose to make sure Pennsylvania's best days are ahead of us. He's going to fight for abortion rights. He's going to fight to raise the minimum wage and protect the union way of life. He's going to fight to protect our planet. He's going to fight to eliminate the filibuster. He's going to fight to legalize cannabis. He's going to fight against gun violence. He's going to fight against inflation and corporate greed. And he's going to fight so this country starts making things again the way it once did in Braddock. Tonight, we're going to celebrate this victory. Because if you're in this room, you made it happen. Thank you. <laughs> if you knocked at a door, if you don't need it, remains in the hospital it, tonight, recovering from a stroke that he suffered on Friday the 13th. Just got a new pacemaker tonight as well as a victory. We are projecting here at ABC News that he has clinched uh, the Democratic nomination for Pennsylvania Senate. Uh, his wife, Giselle, stepping up to the mic tonight because he is in the hospital still recovering, uh, talking about how her grandmother said that he had to be made that tall to fit his whole heart. And some very uh, sweet remarks there from his wife, Giselle. And now the race for the Pennsylvania Senate is, of course, in the national spotlight to talk about what's at stake is Democratic Congresswoman Madeline Dean of Pennsylvania. Congresswoman, thanks so much for joining us. First off, just like to start out by getting uh, your reaction to the news that it seems that John Fetterman has clinched that Democratic nomination. I'm delighted for Pennsylvania. So thank you for having me tonight. Uh, congratulations, John Fetterman, our lieutenant governor. Congratulations, Giselle. I happen to know her quite well. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but we ran against each other briefly for lieutenant governor before uh, I had the opportunity to run for Congress. So John and I became unlikely friends as uh, competitors on the campaign trail. Uh, so I wish them all the best. Uh, I'm very excited for Pennsylvania. This couldn't be a more important Senate seat across this country, but certainly for Pennsylvanians. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you how proud I am of the others who ran in this race, the other Democrats, Connor Lamb, my governing partner here uh, in the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. He's an extraordinary man, an extraordinary public servant, so I congratulate him on his run. Malcolm Kenyatta, state representative. I used to be a state representative in Pennsylvania. I know him very, very well. Uh, so these are extraordinary public servants who stepped up, put themselves in the arena uh, for the United States Senate. What a contrast to what's going on on the other side of the aisle. After the 2020 elections, Pennsylvania played, of course, a major role in dispelling any notion that the election was stolen or rigged. Now we see many candidates who keep pushing that, that false narrative, the, the idea that, that the election was stolen. Uh, why is that and, and how important is the, the race for governor in your state? We have Mastriano, for example, who's, who's also um, continuing to peddle that idea that, that the election was stolen. Well, it's extraordinarily important. The Citizens of Pennsylvania deserve better. They deserve public servants who step up and tell the truth, whether it's inconvenient or uncomfortable or painful for them. For Mr. Mastriano or the other candidate on the Senate side, Kathy Barnett, who ran against me in 2020, refused to concede when she lost by nearly 20 points and then went door to door trying to find the fraud. That's how she launched, launched a Senate campaign. Both she and Mr. Mastriano rented buses to have people come down to the January 6th rally and then marched alongside the Proud Boys to the Capitol as Americans attacked our Capitol, our seat of government, and tried to prevent the peaceful transfer of power, tried to undo a lawful legal election. Uh, people need to be very keenly aware of what these candidates on the other side of the aisle stand for. At this point, we all have uh, witnessed the horror in Buffalo that took place over the weekend. What do you think can be done in order to stop these scenes of carnage from just playing out again and again throughout our country? 
Well, I hope you know that uh, that's, gun violence is something I've cared about my entire life. Before I got into public service, I took my kids, my husband and I took our kids to the Million Mom March in the year 2000. Uh, I started the PA Safe Caucus in Pennsylvania House following Sandy Hook. When we came to Congress in 2019, I was very proud that the Judiciary Committee, for the first time in almost two, more than two decades, had our first hearing on gun violence, and we passed universal background checks. We passed closing the Charleston loophole. That's what Democrats do. They believe in protecting our safety and the safety of our children. What happened with those bills? We did it twice. We did it in 19, and we did it in this Congress. They sit over in the Senate dead because first, Mr. McConnell, who was uh, the leader at the time, and now because of the filibuster. Uh, I call upon all of us. We will, we're going to bring more legislation to the floor in the House. But we have to pressure this Senate to make sure they actually stand up to their duty to protect our children. Do you know that during the COVID pandemic, 45,000 people died of gun violence. That's a 5,000 person souls increase. 4,400 of them children. Another 100,000 caught in the crossfire. I don't know how Republican senators sit on their hands, sitting, hiding behind the filibuster as a minority party in some sort of control. I don't know how they sleep at night knowing our children are at risk how they sleep at night knowing white supremacy is one of our greatest threats. Look what happened in Buffalo. An 18-year-old radicalized, white 18-year-old male, radicalized, armed with a Bushmaster and a large capacity, tactical gear, goes in and aims at black Americans. It's heartbreaking. These senators, these Republican senators, how dare they fail to lead and save our children. Congresswoman Madeline Dean, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you very much. And let's bring back in ABC News contributor, former DNC chair and Democratic strategist Donna Brazil, and former chief of, sta of staff to Vice President uh, uh, Mike Pence. Mark Short, thank you both so much for joining us again tonight. So, Mark, I'd like to get your reaction to Fetterman's wife's speech. How hard will that be for a Republican to go up against in November? I think she was very dynamic. I think that, uh, you know, the challenge for some Democrats is I think that Connor Lamb was was viewed in many cases as an ideal candidate in Pennsylvania. I think it's going to be a difficult midterm cycle for Democrats. Uh, I think usually when one party's in power, you see the other party come back in a midterm cycle. You saw it in 2010. You saw it in 2018. I think you're going to see a similar dynamic in 2022. And Connor Lamb was somebody who was a more moderate candidate. I think you're going to see something similar Rick Klein mentioned earlier tonight. But I think in Oregon, you're going to see a moderate Democrat congressman lose his renomination battle against a far more progressive candidate that's going to create challenges. So uh, I think that uh, Fetterman's uh, wife gave a, gave a dramatic uh, speech and, and was well received. But um, we'll have to wait and see how it plays out across the rest of the uh, state in, the, in throughout November, because the predominant issue for a lot of people is going to be Joe Biden's popularity, what they're paying in gas prices, what they're paying at the grocery store, the inflation that, that, uh, that is incurred. And there's really no suggestion that's going to ebb anytime in the next few months. And Donna, so much focus has been in recent weeks on Trump-endorsed candidates, but on the Democratic side, progressives are hoping tonight helps them begin to reshape the Democratic Party. Do you think the Democrats may learn the model could be blue-collar style candidates like Fetterman or Tim Ryan, which is something that Heidi Heitkamp was suggesting earlier? Well, first of all, I, I'm proud that we have so many different uh, diverse candidates who are running for office. I mean, um, as the Congresswoman mentioned, we, we had all of the great wealth of riches in, in Pennsylvania with a young, dynamic state representative from Philadelphia who was able to put together a coalition that spanned the state, but clearly he could not sweep the tide that was already in the favor of the lieutenant governor, someone that people know. Uh, John Carl Fetterman is a different kind of Democrat. And let me just tell you, I've met all flavors of Democrats and he's a different kind of Democrat. I think he will be able to appeal not just to Democratic voters and the uh, suburbs or uh, the urban cities, but he will be able to appeal to independents and non-aligned Republicans who might be looking for an alternative to a Trump-endorsed candidate. 
So I think we have a real shot in that open seat. And I want to just say this. Sherry Beasley, who's run statewide in North Carolina before, this is a woman with a proven record, uh, the former justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, the former associate justice. She's running nonpartisan races. She's put her hat with the Democratic Party, and I hope to see uh, that she is able uh, to win her race in the state of North Carolina against another Trump-endorsed candidate. You get the theme there. So this is going to be a dynamic year. And yes, I'm watching races not only tonight, but next week, ah, George is, uh, is going to be on my mind. And Georgia on your mind. Like, what was that, Ray Charles? All right. I thank you both. ABC News contributor, former DNC Ray cha Charles. chair and Democratic strategist Donna Brazil, legislative affairs director to former President Trump, who was also the former chief of staff to Vice President Pence, Mark Short. We thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Lizzie. Thank you. And when we come back, we'll talk about the governor's races and why in states like Pennsylvania they may play a critical role in national politics. Stay with us. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to say. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck, and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently, and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go anytime free download the abc news app now breaking news exclusives 24 7 there for you with one touch the abc news app download it now i risked my life if i was caught they would have put a bullet in my head that would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the united states he put himself in jeopardy for us Welcome back once again now to Pennsylvania's primary race for governor. Republicans are the only contested race here. State Senator Doug Mastriano has been leading in the polls. He continues to do so with 26% of the votes reporting right now. 42% followed by Lou Barletta with 23%. Bill McSwain with just 15% of the vote. For a closer look at this race, ABC uh, Deputy Director Avery Harper joins us now. Avery, Mastriano helped to, to push the big lie. How does that stance impact his standing in the polls? Well, it's uh, likely helping him. We're seeing that he is currently ahead. We still have a large portion of the vote uh, still outstanding, uh, but things are looking good for him right now. Uh, you know, it's important to note that Mastriano had uh, Trump's endorsement, uh, and even before he had that, that late endorsement from the former president, he was a favorite to win his primary. Uh, but we have to be clear, this is a primary, and so uh, these candidates are trying to appeal uh, to the most energized, and sometimes that means the most extreme uh, portions of the base. I think that uh, when it comes to the general election, uh, when Mastriano or whoever wins in this primary will have to appeal to uh, the broader electorate, that's going to be a different animal. And let's pivot to the Democrats. They hope that progressives help their efforts to remold the party. Former presidential candidates Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, both made endorsements this election season. Who are they and, and what does it mean come November? 
Right. Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders and Senator Elizabeth Warren, they have endorsed and put their uh, progressive muscle behind several candidates uh, in, in battleground states like Pennsylvania, Oregon, and North Carolina. I do want to focus on one of those races. That's North Carolina's 4th District. That's the uh, race where uh, Clay Aiken of American Idol fame uh, was running. We do have a projection in that race, and ABC uh, does project that Valerie Fushi will win. Fushi was a state lawmaker, and she has deep ties and deep roots in that district. She's uh, was considered the establishment candidate and was the beneficiary of millions of dollars of super PAC support. Uh, and in this overwhelmingly blue district, she's likely to be heading to Congress, uh, and she's going to be the first uh, black woman to hold that seat. So there's some history made there. Warren and Sanders had actually uh, endorsed another candidate. Her name was Nita Alam. Uh, Nita was a, a local lawmaker. She's the first uh, Muslim woman ever elected to uh, office in the state of North Carolina. Uh, she was somebody who said supported the Green New Deal. Uh, she supported Medicare for All. Uh, and so here we're seeing the uh, the plan to sort of try and get some of those progressive wins on the board. It really fell short in this race. And uh, then you see Clay Aiken there. A lot of political insiders in the state had told me well before uh, polls closed today that they did not believe uh, that he was going to come out on top, that he was a sort of a long shot candidate in this race. Uh, and so I'm going to be watching some of those similar races in uh, places like Pennsylvania, in Oregon, uh, to see if these efforts for progressives uh, to try and influence the direction of the party uh, against some of these more moderate candidates, if that's going to shake out in some of these other races. Nita Lam had been hoping that she would join the so-called squad that apparently, though, not meant to be. Avery Harper, our thanks to you. And now let's go to uh, Republican Congressman Dan Muser from Pennsylvania. Congressman, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Of course, a big night in your state. How do you think that your party is performing so far? Well, uh, certainly it's a primary, so our party is performing well. Uh, I, the uh, constituency and voters were very energized. There was uh, a lot of promotion, a lot of work, a lot of money spent. We had many candidates in the statewide races. We have some really important House seats as well, where perhaps I've had my, my favorites. Uh, it is a primary, so we just want the, uh, well, frankly, the best conservative that can win uh, and, and do the job for the people uh, for the general election. I think we're seeing that. I, I think for the most part, we're seeing that happen right now. ABC News has projected John Fetterman as the Democratic nominee. How do you think that the Republican candidate will fare against him in November? Well, I mean, I mean, John Fetterman, uh, we all know him, of course, Pennsylvania guy. I mean, he's a self-proclaimed socialist. Um, I even think he jokes about being, frankly, a communist. I mean, he, he has a, an extreme agenda. Um, he's a nice enough fella, but his issues and his policies I think are frankly terrible for America and terrible for Pennsylvania. Um, you know, it's doubling down on all the worst aspects of everything that the Biden administration has done, from open borders to assault on domestic energy. Energy is real important to Pennsylvania, to spending uh, to no end, solving every problem with high levels of spending, which does nothing but drive inflation. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to work real hard to defeat him. <laughs> of course. And we have three very different candidates for the GOP party at the forefront of an extremely contested Senate race tonight. What do you hope the nominee will bring to the table if they are able to win in November? Well, um, I, I backed uh, Dave McCormick, and Dave brings a lot to the table. Real smart guy. He's from my district. Uh, he went to Bloomsburg High School, uh, went to West Point, served our country in the Army, knows military affairs, knows business, has a great family. Um, and what the best thing about Dave is, along with him being a patriot, is that he's accessible. He will be one of our Pennsylvanians. He, he's doing it because he loves Pennsylvania, he loves our country. And I, I just look forward to working with him. And my problem with Dr. Oz, and, and uh, you know, I really never got Dr. Oz. You know, he's from New Jersey. I mean, he's got, uh, you know, different type, different backgrounds. He's, he's more about show business than he is, than he is uh, the people's business. You know, we, we don't really need another uh, person chasing down a, uh, a camera here in, here in Washington. I like people coming here to work. But, um, you know, again, nice enough guy. Uh, but, you know, nice guys are not what this is about. We got serious issues facing our, our state, facing our, our, our country. And I, I want the person who's going to really work hard and do the best job possible and put the greater good ahead of themselves 
every day. Congressman Dan Muser, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Appreciate it. Thank you. And joining us now is Democratic political strategist and former DNC communications director, Sochi Inohosa. Uh, Sochi, thanks so much for being here. Uh, what's your reaction overall tonight, especially to key races like Pennsylvania? Well, I think as Democrats are looking forward to the midterm elections and they're seeing what's happening in Pennsylvania tonight, where there was a, is a decisive victory for John Fetterman, um, and, and then Republicans are still sort of fighting it out. It was a very contentious primary on the Republican side, and while Democrats are coming out united, um, it looks like there will be a lot of damage to be repaired on the Republican side. So if I were the Democratic Party tonight, I would feel good heading into November, into the midterm elections. We have a very tight Senate. We understand that every seat will count. This would be a flip opportunity for Democrats um, and would help them pass key legislation moving forward if we were able to flip it. And it could be potentially be Democrats' opportunity to hold on to the Senate. So if you are a Democrat tonight, you're looking really happy about these results. And then you have North Carolina, where we're definitely making history there, potentially putting um, another black woman senator into the United States Senate. And with the, both North Carolina and Pennsylvania, Democrats should feel good going into November. In Pennsylvania, abortion politics are playing out. The leading Republicans for governor want to outlaw abortion. The presumptive Democratic nominee promises to veto any ban. But given inflation, is the issue of abortion enough to really move the needle? Well, I think that all of these candidates will make clear where they stand on Roe v. Wade, given what's at stake, um, given the draft opinion that leaked. I think that Democrats are using it as an opportunity to ensure that they are showing where their values stand and their values stand on the side of the American people, on the side of women. At the same time, I do think that Americans care about rising costs. They care about rising costs at the pump. They care about rising food costs. They also care about the pandemic still. They care, they wanna make sure that we're getting over this pandemic. So Democrats, yes, they will talk a lot about what's happening and, and women's reproductive access to care. But at the same time, that's not the only thing that people are talking about. I think that when you look at a candidate like John Fetterman, he's not your typical politician. And he is someone that is coming out on top of the Democratic primary. He's known as someone who has fought for his constituents as Lieutenant Governor. And so you have two very strong candidates who won't run away from their values, um, but at the same time, understand the issues that Americans care about and people in their state care about and we'll fight to address those. And of course, you talked about rising food costs. Inflation is certainly a big problem for Democrats right now. What more do you feel that the party could be doing to help Americans feel a bit better about increased cost of, of groceries and gas that in many cases people can't afford and they're getting a second job just to pay for the gas to get to their first job? Well, I think it's really smart for President Biden and this administration to tackle this issue head on. And he wants to do more. There's more that he wants to do in order to, to make sure that we're lowering costs for families. He wants to pass legislation. Um, he wants to ensure, and he's trying to use every tool in his arsenal in order to make sure that we are, um, are in fact reducing costs for families. What I think is interesting is that while the administration and Democrats are fighting to do that, Republicans have not come to the table yet. Instead, they're using inflation as a political talking point instead of actually trying to help Americans. And so as long as Democrats can talk directly to the American people about how they are reducing costs for Americans, um, and they do so in the months ahead, then I, and they need to continue to do that, to be honest with you, and they need to ramp up those efforts because that is one of the top issues facing Americans and they wanna see their Democratic leadership fighting for them. Democratic political strategist, Sochi Inohosa, we thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And joining us now on the phone is Pennsylvania Secretary of State Lee Chapman. Uh, Lee, thanks so much for your time tonight, Secretary. Uh, I understand that thousands of mail-in ballots were printed incorrectly in a rural county in your state, Lancaster. Uh, what's the situation there, and, and how will it impact the overall count? Sure. So um, today, you know, we had a very successful election in Pennsylvania. Um, with minimal issues. Um, so there were just a few issues, um, one in Lancaster County, which you just mentioned today. Um, this morning when election officials began pre-canvassing mail-in ballots, 
they discovered that an estimated 22,000 mail ballots um, printed by the vendor contained an incorrect code that could not be read by the scanner. So um, over the next few days, the county election officials in Lancaster County will be um, you know, counting those 22,000 ballots in the Department of State, and my office is committed to working closely with them to make sure that every voter's um, vote is counted. And for months, uh, many Republicans, including several running in your state, have maintained falsely that the 2020 election was stolen, including repeatedly saying former President Trump won in Pennsylvania. That, of course, is not true. Has everything gone smoothly other than that hiccup? And, and I assume that, that you're confident in the results? Yes, we're confident in the results, and voters in Pennsylvania can be confident in the results and the integrity of our election system. And, you know, the, the 2020 election was a free election. It was fair. It was secure. You know, there was no widespread voter fraud. Um, allegations of fraud and illegal activity in the 2020 presidential election have been repeatedly dismissed in dozens of state and federal court cases around the country and debunked by independent fact checkers. So. Um, you know, it's, it's really important that, you know, voters are confident in their elections and um, in the election officials that work countless hours and work hard every single day to make sure voters have access to the ballot box. Lee Chapman, we thank you so much for your time and want to give an update. ABC News has another projection to make in the state of Pennsylvania. There you see it, Doug Mastriano. Um, presumptively the uh, Republican uh, nominee clinching that on for governor of Pennsylvania, Doug Mastriano with 43% of the vote, 31% of the vote reported there, but uh, uh, pretty uh, far lead uh, uh, above Lou Barletta as well as Bill McSwain there with just 15% of the vote. More election coverage when we come back. Stay with us. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risked my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. Welcome back, everyone. Our primary election coverage continues. Let's turn now to the battleground state of North Carolina, where there are several House races getting some national attention. In the 13th District for the Democrats, a two-term state senator, Wiley Nickel, who worked with President Obama. You see he has been projected there with 53% of the vote of the 45 that have been counted so far. And in a stacked Democratic race, a former American Idol star on the ballot, Clay Aiken not doing so so well.
well with only 7%. Valerie Fushi, who was expected uh, to dominate the race, doing exactly that tonight with 69% of the vote reporting. And in the state's 11th district, embattled first-term Congressman Madison Cawthorn fighting to keep his seat after several scandals over the past few months. And you see Cawthorn there in second place behind Chuck Edwards. Chuck Edwards with 34% of the vote so far. Perhaps um, those scandals taking a toll on Madison Cawthorn, but too tight and too soon uh, to predict a victor in that race right now. And now let's go to ABC News contributor Sarah Isker. Uh, Sarah, the country still, of course, reeling from the mass shooting in Buffalo on Saturday, and once again sparking up the national debate over gun control. Do you think that there is anything that could move Republicans on this issue? I think at this point, Republicans are looking at the 2022 November election and looking at crime as one of their top issues. Uh, moving on guns, frankly, would undermine some of that message. They're saying crime is being caused by a bad economy, by Joe Biden not using the full weight of the Department of Justice to come down on violent criminals. Uh, interestingly, though, both in the Buffalo shooting and in the shooting at the church in California, both guns purchased legally. Uh, so often and we see in these crimes illegal gun purchases. Not the case here. And I think that does contribute to an overall conversation on uh, whether there is more that can be done. Of course, the Supreme Court also looking at a New York gun law and whether there's a right to carry outside the home in the state of New York. Of course, we're seeing a wide variety, lots of variation in the candidates on the ballot tonight, including Trump endorsees and big lie believers. Uh, what about any of the candidates has surprised you in particular? Well, I think we're learning a lot about what Donald Trump's endorsement can do for a race and what it can't do. You know, in Ohio, we saw the race uh, really shift when Donald Trump's endorsement was made, but not necessarily the way I think the narrative has played out. Uh, obviously, Donald Trump's endorsed candidate won, and that absolutely speaks to the power of Donald Trump's endorsement. But we also saw the least Trump-esque candidate move up 10 points after Donald Trump's endorsement. So it's more that voters want that information, especially among candidates that they don't know very well. And you look at what's happening right tonight in Pennsylvania, Donald Trump's endorsed candidate running in second, neck and neck, with another candidate in that Pennsylvania Senate race. Very interesting. And then, of course, in Georgia, Donald Trump's endorsed candidate for that Senate race, running almost double digits behind Governor Kemp. Uh, apologies for that governor's race, not Senate race, in Georgia. Uh, so we're seeing the limitations. You know, in North Carolina tonight, Donald Trump's candidate had a blowout uh, for the governor's um, race down there, but he was also... Uh, endorsed by Club for Growth. Club for Growth and Donald Trump had split in that Ohio race. So obviously when Republicans are united around one candidate and Donald Trump endorses, that is the cherry on top. But when you have a race like, for instance, the North Carolina House race, Madison Cawthorn running now uh, just over a thousand votes behind tonight, uh, Donald Trump's chosen candidate, but you had a lot of other Republicans in the state endorsing his opponent who is currently ahead. Uh, really good distinctions there to make. Sarah Isker, our thanks to you. And now let's bring back in ABC News political director Rick Klein. Rick, same question from Sarah to you. Any surprises for you tonight? Yeah, Lindsay, I, to, to dig in a little bit on, on some of the races we've been watching tonight, I've been watching a lot of a lot of the, the churn in the North Carolina congressional delegation because they're adding a seat. They also have some key retirements. Uh, and as talked about, Clay Aiken was the big name in the race, and he is not going to be in Congress. Uh, he's tried before. Uh, he has been uh, he's been voted off or whatever they do in American Idol. I'm not even sure how that works exactly, but uh, not going to be not a good night for American Idol fans, regardless. And as Sarah mentioned, uh, over here in the uh, in the 11th congressional district in the West part of the state. Right now, Madison Cawthorn is, le is trailing by a little more than a thousand votes. We don't know where that's going to land, but it isn't the kind of night that he was expecting. And Bo Hines, another person that Donald Trump kind of plucked from obscurity, uh, right now he's, he's, he's a slight favorite, but also a big question mark. And I do think it points to some of the limits of celebrity politics and the limits of a Trump endorsement. Uh, we're not seeing uh, candidates just follow a big name or follow direction from, uh, from even the, the biggest name in Republican politics. And let's take a look at Kentucky, where Senator Rand Paul seeking a third term in the Senate despite signing a pledge in 2019 to support an amendment limiting senators to two terms. 
Yeah, let me tell you, uh, Democrats would love to defeat Senator Rand Paul. Kentucky is a very red state. This is what the House of Representatives uh, map looks like. Only this third district around the Louisville area is the little blue dot. Charles Booker uh, considered a very strong candidate, will be a progressive darling. He ran for Senate uh, in the last election cycle, uh, fell short in the primary to Amy McGrath, who was one of the most celebrated recruits of the year. I think this is going to be a magnet for national money. There's no question that Democrats are going to pour resources into Kentucky. They would love to defeat uh, Senator Paul, but to be realistic about the kind of environment we're looking at, I mean, just look at all of this red territory up and down Kentucky, particularly in a year like this, that is so hard to overcome. So I think it is going to be, uh, it is going to be a, a, a talking point, and, and I don't think Charles Booker is going to have any trouble getting invitations to every potential uh, fundraising event, but, uh, but Senator Rand Paul is not going to be uh, at the top of the list of endangered incumbents. <laughs> all right, that's a good way to put it. Rick Klein, our thanks to you. Again, we'll be checking back with you throughout the night. And let's turn now to Kentucky, where the vote's still coming in, and one candidate projected to win easily is Republican Congressman Thomas Massey. He joins us tonight. Congressman, it, it, let's actually jump ahead to November. It, how confident are you that Republicans can retake the House? Well, you know, there's not going to be any change in the status quo here in Kentucky. We're five and one, five Republicans, one Democrat. Um, I'm pretty confident. I think there's a lot of anti-incumbency uh, you know, sentiment there in the country. You're seeing that in the primaries, by the way. And um, I think that's going to spill over into the general and a lot of Democrats will lose. Your fellow Kentuckian, Senator Mitch McConnell, has seemed to really reject the idea that Republicans need to lay out an agenda of what they would do if the GOP retakes Congress. What's your view? Do you think that Republicans need to make clear their priorities as they face voters in the fall? You know, I've got one priority, and that is to separate these bills. If Republicans take the majority instead of putting everything into an omnibus bill, which, by the way, we did that under John Boehner and Paul Ryan, and Nancy Pelosi's continued the trend, but that's just stupid. It's irresponsible. And so uh, my agenda wouldn't necessarily be policy. It would be process. Let's make Congress work. And specifically, what would Republicans suggest in order to try to get inflation under control that the Biden administration or Democrats currently aren't doing? <laughs> you know, the problem is uh, Congress has caused inflation, and a lot of Republicans went along with that. I was one of the few who opposed it. There, and so the genie's out of the bottle. We printed money, and you can't unprint the money. So the inflation is here with us. There are things we can do in the food sector and the energy sector. And that's what we should focus on, because those are two things everybody needs, regardless of how much money you make. You can't unprint the money. Well said there. <laughs> of course, you, you won the endorsement of former President Trump in your race, despite him once calling you a, quote, do-nothing Kentucky politician and a third-rate grandstander after you threatened to delay COVID spending bills that the former president supported. He's now praising you as a conservative warrior. How tricky is it for Republicans on whether or not to, to embrace the former president or not? Well, in Kentucky, it's not a problem. He's very favorable in the Republican primary, and he doesn't hurt you in the general because so many Democrats here in Kentucky who are still registered Democrats support Donald Trump. Um, it's, it helps to have that, but it's not necessary to win an election. All right, Congressman Massey, our thanks to you. Appreciate your time tonight. Thanks, Lindsay. And let's bring back in Legislative Affairs Director to former President Trump, who was also the former Chief of Staff to Vice President Mike Pence, Mark Short. Uh, so, Mark, what do you think is the single most important thing that we've learned tonight about who may ultimately control the balance of power in both the House as well as the Senate? Well, Lindsay, I think that uh, the balance of power is going to shift come November. And I think the reality of that is that people are still going to have exorbitantly high gas prices. Inflation is going to be a problem. And there's really growing sentiment that we may actually be facing a recession. So I think those factors are going to be the overwhelming deciding factor come November. But I think tonight, I think something else we've learned is, is continually that Donald Trump does have a significant impact amongst Republican primary voters. But that in and of itself is not sufficient. And I think you're probably going to see Madison Cawthorn fall tonight, despite his endorsement from President Trump. And I think you're seeing uh, a continuation of people who are competitive primaries with the Trump endorsement 
pretty much tap out in the 30 percent, whether or not uh, that is Vance in Ohio, whether or not that's Oz in Pennsylvania or Cawthorn in North Carolina. I think that uh, there's, a, there's a continuing trend that that is helpful, but it's not something that, that is going to necessarily carry over the edge unless you put forward your own agenda. And I think if you look at Ted Budd's victory tonight, I think what's being missed in this is the Club for Growth spent roughly $15 million in consecutive ad campaigns week after week after week tearing down McCrory and Walker and promoting Ted Budd. They deserve a lot of the, the credit for Ted Budd's victory tonight. And with regard to, to Cawthorn, for example, are you surprised, because we do know that the former president seems to take his endorsement so seriously and, and, and as a personal affront for him if the candidate doesn't win, are you surprised that, that he took that gamble on, on Madison? I am a little bit. I think there's no doubt that the president um, is looking at those who who are wanting to relitigate the 2020 election and uh, the aftermath as much as possible. And so that's why he wanted to stick with Cawthorn. But, you know, there's an irony there, too, about loyalty, because you look at Pennsylvania and Lou Barletta was perhaps the very first elected official in the country to stand up and say he was for Donald Trump. And yet Donald Trump decided to endorse his opponent in Mastriano in Pennsylvania. So there is an irony about that loyalty. It seems the loyalty is more reflective about who was who's continuing to promote the president's viewpoint on the 2020 election and the aftermath. And now let's turn to that shooting in Buffalo and the messaging from the Republican Party. You served, of course, in the Trump administration. The former president, as you know, really seemed to struggle at times to, to play consoler in chief after a divisive attack. Charlottesville, of course, will come to mind for many. Liz Cheney, though, came out strongly tweeting that House GOP leadership has enabled white nationalism, white supremacy, and anti-Semitism. Uh, she didn't name any names, but many have criticized the lawmaker who replaced Cheney as the, the number three Republican in the House, at least Stefanik, for her attacks on migrants. Uh, Stefanik has bristled at the insinuations, but uh, what do you think the Republican Party leadership can do in this moment to really try to bring people together and, and not just the Republican base? Well, I think that uh, we all as a nation uh, need to condemn this violence, and I think it's, it's broader than the Buffalo attack. I think what we've seen in recent weeks as well is, um, is attacks on uh, pro-life centers who are looking to stand up in the, in the Dobbs case. I think you've seen other acts of violence in churches, and I think it, it, we need to stand up against the violence. I strongly disagree with, with Congresswoman Cheney. I don't think you can place this blame at the hands of uh, Republican legislators. I think that uh, many of the, uh, the answers to these questions, are, I think, are frankly started in the family, in the home. And, uh, and I think one of the things that we learned after some of the school shootings that occurred during the previous four years, we brought in some of those who are, who are basically looking to highlight the violence in video games today and how much that is prevalent in our younger generation, our 18, 19, 20-year-olds, and, and what they're seeing and becoming desensitized to. And so I think the problem is much broader. I, I don't think it's right or fair for Congresswoman Cheney to, uh, to attack uh, fellow Republican members in leadership and, and lay the blame of the, the Buffalo massacre there. We should be con all condemning it. We should be condemning any notion of racism, and we should be offering uh, prayers and, and sympathy for the families, and, and that's not a partisan thing. All right, Mark Short, our thanks to you, and there's still a lot more to come. Our powerhouse team is not going anywhere. A lot more to dissect from tonight's election results as we continue to monitor several still undecided races. Stay with us. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now.
This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risk my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. coverage continues here on ABC News Live Prime. One of the most closely watched races is, of course, the battle for the GOP Senate nomination in Pennsylvania. For a while, this race seemed like a two-man battle between TV personality Dr. Mehmet Oz, backed by former President Trump and establishment pick Dave McCormick. But in the final days of campaigning, polls showed that it became a three-way battle with hard-right candidate Kathy Barnett surging. And here is where things stand at this hour. Getting much tighter there between Dave McCormick and Mehmet Oz, 32% to 31%. Kathy Barnett really taking more of a, uh, a distant a third place there with 23% of the vote, but still only about half of the votes reported so far. Of course, we're going to continue keeping a close eye on that race tonight. Let's go next to ABC News correspondent Alex Perche inside the campaign headquarters of Dr. Mehmet Oz. Alex, Dr. Oz got that highly coveted Trump endorsement, but that, that wasn't really enough, it doesn't seem, to overwhelmingly convince Pennsylvania Republicans to back him. And as results are, are, are coming in tonight, we're seeing this tight race play out. Uh, talk to us about what his campaign is saying tonight. Well, Lindsay, right now, I mean, we've seen an energy shift uh, since those early numbers have come in. People glued to the monitor behind me as this race has tightened and cheering from time to time. But I, 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 I did get a chance to speak with David McCormick's campaign. They said that they are encouraged by how the polls are trending. But I'd also point out that not too long ago, they put up the Kathy Barnett headquarters on the monitor here, and they were doing the Macarena. I say that because while there is a large portion of this vote already in, there's still a sizable number of these ballots that are still out. It is very, very early in this race. And tell us about any undecided voters that you've gotten to talk to while you've been there. Well, Lindsay, so what's interesting in this highly personal, uh, at times uh, very uh, ad-heavy race, it's a very expensive race, we've seen a lot of personal attacks here, the undecided Republican voters that we've talked to haven't been concerned about uh, the, the personal dynamics of these campaigns. They're not concerned with where these uh, folks are coming from or, uh, you know, where they were on January 6th. They've been issue-oriented. And so one of the things that we hear come up consistently is the economy uh, and also crime. I spoke to a mother yesterday uh, in Philadelphia who says, I mean, she's got a two-year-old and, and she used to be able to walk through the park. Crime is the number one thing that she's concerned about. And one B would be uh, inflation. And the other thing that I would point out, uh, in our uh, our time here in, in, in Pennsylvania, I did get a chance to speak again with, with the McCormick campaign. And, and, and David McCormick told me that if there is an issue that he believes that he really resonates with uh, Pennsylvania voters on, it's going to be inflation. So we'll see how that plays out going into the night. And of course, inflation so top of mind for many Pennsylvanians as well as Americans in general across the country. Alex Brashear, our thanks to you. And now back to North Carolina in the state's 11th district embattled first term Congressman Madison Cawthorn fighting to stay alive and keep his seat after several scandals over the past few months. Uh, you can see there, it looks like we have projected Wiley Nickel uh, here at ABC News with 53% of the vote. Of course, uh, we have only about half of the votes reported so far. Um, but again, this is for North House uh, District number 13, Wiley Nickel. 
And again, back to North Carolina, the other major battleground state where voters headed to the polls today. Let's bring in anchor Dewan Hogard from ABC station WTVD in Raleigh. Uh, thanks so much for joining us again, Dewan. So one of the storylines that many are tracking tonight is what Republican voters will do about freshman Republican Madison Cawthorn to say he is no stranger to controversy is a bit of an understatement. What can you tell us about how the uproar has played to voters? His, his race currently very close. Well, Lindsay, right now, if you are in the Madison Cawthorn camp, you are refreshing those numbers every chance you get. Now, we have seen within just the past hour, uh, Madison Cawthorn's uh, uh, trailing at one point by six points. Now it's down to one and a half points. Uh, there, there's still just a lot of night left, but we're watching the precincts continue to roll in. So if you're part of his camp, you're wondering if those missteps, which have happened over the course of the last several months, are indeed hurting him. At one point, referring to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky as a thug, then in April trying to pass a loaded gun through the TSA checkpoint down in Charlotte. That happened in April. And then earlier this month, you had that video, which he described as crass or foolish, of him in bed with his cousin. Now, what is that going to mean for voters? We're watching right now. Uh, some of that lead, again, dwindling as we speak. Every moment we refresh again, he's down just by one and a half points. But is that lead going to hold up? We're continuing to watch and wait to see if that happens. Now, his challenger, Chuck Edwards, a guy who many folks may not even exactly know or have such the biggest name in the state. He came into the evening by only raising some $800,000 compared to Madison Cawthorn's $3.5 million that was raised. Is that going to be enough for Mr. Edwards? We'll find out at the end of the night as the precincts continue to roll in and we end up declaring a winner at the end of the evening. Lindsay? And we just saw the results in that Senate race from both parties. Representative Ted Budd was backed by Trump, which was significant because he was up against a former North Carolina governor. Uh, tell us about that race and, and what the November matchup looks like. Yeah, all you have to do is just rewind just a couple of months ago. If you're Ted Budd, you're wondering how is tonight going to play out for you, especially at a time when former Governor Pat McCrory had a decisive double-digit lead over him. Well, we already know what the Trump effect is doing for a lot of candidates this evening. Trump backing Ted Budd. Then we end up seeing McCrory and Budd flip-flop there in the polls to where McCrory actually as of tonight, is no longer the front runner. He came into this evening uh, trailing by double digits against Ted Budd. ABC News just hours ago uh, declaring Ted Budd to be uh, the winner on tonight, who he is going to be up against this November, a woman who we also declare to be the winner as of tonight, is Sherry Beasley, a big name here in the state. Uh, she was a former North Carolina uh, justice here, just right around the corner is where she held a seat. She's going to go neck to neck, and we just heard from uh, one one of our reporters uh, across town who's at her victory party. She is energetic about tonight. She looks forward to going head to head with Ted Budd come November. This is going to be a race where a lot of money is going to be spent and we're going to find out how voters right here in North Carolina, which uh, is a purple state by all regards, will play out in that November election. So we're going to continue to watch that. And these next few months, Lindsay, going to be really interesting here. Purple for sure. Dewan Hogard, thank you again. Appreciate your time. Now to the races in Kentucky. Incumbent Senator Rand Paul seeking a third term in the U.S. Senate. And ABC News has projected that he will win the nomination for a GOP Senate primary. There you see Rand Paul with 86 percent of the vote. Nearly all of the votes counted there at this point in the Kentucky Democratic Senate primary. ABC News projects that Charles Booker will win. You see him there. Dominant lead, 73 percent of the vote. Vote. And again, 99% of the votes there counted. And now we want to pivot to the internal tug of war of the Democrats, progressives versus Democrats. And joining us now for a bit of a deeper dive is the former mayor of Baltimore and former DNC secretary, Ms. Stephanie Rawlings Blake. Stephanie, uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, so give us a sense of, of your thoughts here. Which side saw advancements tonight, the progressives or the moderates? Lindsay, thank you so much for having me here. As I look at the election results, it reminds me of when I was standing on the stage in Philadelphia calling the roll call of the states for the Democratic Convention, and there was a uh, almost a literal battle between the progressive wing of the party and um, the standard bearers of the party over the Bernie Sanders um, nomination and what I got to witness and participate I see in all of these elections going forward and what I knew then is what I know now 
we have to decide who we are as a party and what we're willing uh, to, to put aside in order for these critical rights to be protected. Uh, we don't have the, the luxury of fighting amongst ourselves when we have voting rights on the line, when we have abortion rights on the line. And I think uh, this, uh, these elections are calling on us to, to uh, come together in strength if we are going to push back against uh, a threat to, a real threat to our democracy. Right, House divided cannot stand. Let's talk, of course, about Pennsylvania's John Fetterman, the, the stroke comeback king, if you will. He's uh, certainly an interesting candidate, not your run-of-the-mill kind of politician. He wants to end the filibuster and also legalize marijuana. But do you think that he has mass appeal for his state of Pennsylvania, possibly more so than Dr. Oz? I, I definitely think he has uh, more appeal uh, than, than Dr. Oz. I, I think the thing with Fetterman is he's not seen as a performer. Uh, he, he is being um, hailed as, you know, a, a, a regular Joe, uh, someone that people can relate to. And I hope um, with his health challenges, hopefully uh, soon to be behind him, um, he will reach out to the more moderates in the party and find things that we can agree on, find things that we can work on, because, um, you know, Pennsylvania, um, you know, which is, I'm in uh, Maryland, Pennsylvania, which is so close, right next door to us, um, you know, if this election goes the wrong way, we'll be looking to ban abortions. And I would ne I never thought that I would see that uh, in, in Pennsylvania, but with the Republican um, side of the ticket, it's, it's a foregone conclusion that, that would, that's what will happen. Former Mayor of Baltimore and former DNC Secretary Stephanie Rawlings. Blake, we thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. And now let's bring in Idaho Congressman Representative Russ Fulcher. Uh, so, Congressman, votes still coming out, in, coming in in your state, people still making their voices heard. Uh, so I thank you so much for joining us at this time. What are you hearing most from constituents in terms of what matters most to them? You know, we're going to have uh, 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 Joe Biden on the ballot to, today, and the results are going to be reflecting of that. I'm over the state all the time, and what we hear is people are simply just not happy. I mean, the, the gas prices, the food prices, the border security issue, the energy situation. Uh, Idaho is a conservative state, and uh, everybody that's on the ballot, one way or another, has uh, been referencing the situation that we're in as a nation. And what can we as a state do? What can they as a candidate do to try to change the course? Because uh, uh, that's those are the factors that are driving people to the polls in Idaho. And we are watching a battle play out in many red states between Trump-endorsed candidates and other candidates that the so-called establishment view may be safer when it comes to the general election. Would you describe similar trends in the state of Idaho? I think so. Uh, you know, we're we're a microcosm of the nation, of course. We here are impacted by a lot of the same things, but uh, we're kind of an oasis for a uh, more traditional mindset. And you see people moving to Idaho in droves, many from California, many from Oregon, Washington. Uh, when the riots were taking place here uh, within the last year, year and a half in Spokane and, and uh, Seattle and Portland, that triggered a, a lot of movement to Idaho because it was looked as a, uh, a more conservative state, a safer place to be. So that's the environment there. And uh, uh, so uh, the political candidates are driven by that. They know that message. That's the constituents say they serve. And uh, they're, they're just not happy with the direction that is coming out of Washington, D.C. right now. And so that's those are the items that are on the ballot. And I would say that's similar across the nation, but maybe even more so in Idaho. And when you served in the Idaho Senate, you helped push through a grocery tax credit that, according to your office, was the largest tax cut in Idaho's history. Uh, what do you feel should be done to combat soaring inflation right now throughout the country? Well, is uh, frankly, a lot of that is driven out of Washington, D.C., but we can reflect that with our state policy as well. But uh, a monetary policy needs to be constrained so that we're not spending quite so much uh, and, and printing money and, and, uh, and diluting the, the money supply as a result of that. That's a big factor. Our commerce policy has had a big impact. The fact that we've kind of suffocated ourselves with our energy restrictions on ourselves and forced us to have to purchase 
from our enemies has had a big impact. Those are all policies that need to be changed that's driven out of Washington, D.C., but our states are, are trying to react to that too and, and do what they can to try to change things. Representative, we so appreciate you talking with us tonight. My pleasure, thank you. Back to Pennsylvania now, where despite a health scare, popular everyman candidate and Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman has been projected to win his race for the Senate there. Uh, let's go to his wife, Giselle, who is, spoke tonight in his place at his victory party. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. You know, there's been uh, so much about politics. I think that people sometimes forget about uh, the personal. Just kind of give us a sense as much as you can as far as the medical prognosis of your husband tonight. Sure. Well, it's very positive. He had a very successful surgery today, so he's well on his way to a full recovery. Um, but, you know, identifying the stroke and going through that experience for me was was a lot. And I, I really want folks to be aware that uh, what subtle stroke symptoms look like so that you can identify them and, and save someone's life as well. I, I know you've talked to him tonight or been with him tonight. What's been his reaction to his win? Oh, he, there was, he put a video up and he looked adorable and happy and, um, you know, it's been a long road here and we're grateful to be able to celebrate together very soon. How critical is it uh, for Pennsylvania and for the country, really, for you guys to flip this seat? Well, this is the seat that can decide everything, so it's why it's going to be the most watched seat in the country uh, and it's critical to make this seat a blue seat. You've been out on the ground, of course, campaigning with your husband. What kind of frustration are you hearing from Pennsylvania residents? What's so important to them in this, in this election? Inflation has been a big one always. You know, the minimum wage is a big one. We want to make sure that we can, you know, families can live on something that they can raise families on. And it would lift millions out of poverty um, if we were to work on the minimum wage. So those are concerns, you know, legalizing cannabis. That's a very popular topic anywhere we go across the state. Um, Roe v. Wade, a big one, uh, working to, to codify that. So there's any number of hard issues that he'd be working on. Uh, your husband, of course, a Harvard grad, but people describe him as very blue collar, that he's every man and relatable across the spectrum. What is it about your husband that you feel he should be uh, the next senator in Pennsylvania? Well, he's a really compassionate person. He has the experience, he has the dedication. He's always wanted to be in places that have been forgotten or left behind, and he really cares. And I think with politics, politicians have a bad rep often um, because they're not people like him. And I want him to be the person who changes that description of politicians. Giselle, we thank you so much. I loved what you had to say earlier when you said that he, your grandmother said that, that he, God had to make his body so big to fit uh, all of his heart. Uh, really some, <laughs> some, some sweet and, and compassionate words that, that only uh, would be convincing coming from his wife. So, so we thank you so much for your time tonight and, and congratulations Absolutely. on the win. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And now let's go back to ABC News political director Rick Klein. Uh, is, oh, Rick is not with us just yet. We'll get to him right after the break. Stay with us. More of our primary election coverage continues. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. 
This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risk my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. Welcome back, everybody. We want to go right to Madison Cawthorn in Kentucky. Oh, we don't have him live, but apparently he is conceding the race. Of course, he's been dogged by controversy uh, for several months at this point. For more on that, let's go back to ABC News political director uh, Rick Klein. Your thoughts on this? Yeah, we just got word, ABC News um, just heard back from the campaign, the Cawthorn campaign, and it learned that Madison Cawthorn has conceded that race. Uh, it is a major shock uh, because President Trump is as popular as he is in the Republican base. Take a look at this district. It is a, it is a rural, redder part of, of, of North Carolina now. Madison Cawthorn at one point talked about moving out of that district somewhere else. We know about all the controversy, but it is a surprise. Trump, even as late as yesterday, said give the kid another chance. Uh, all the scandals, all the controversy, it appears that voters in North Carolina uh, have had enough of it. Uh, and, and I'd add at the same time, we're, as we track these results in, in Pennsylvania, it is a closer than expected Senate race. Uh, Kathy Barnett right now does not look to be in the vote so far uh, among the top two. Uh, but Dave McCormick, who Trump uh, really went out and, and anti-endorsed in a way, went, went for Dr. Oz, but also said don't support Dave McCormick, running surprisingly strong. Oz holding a lot of parts of the state that Trump was able to carry uh, two years ago. So we are seeing, as I think some of our guests have referenced earlier today, a mixed bag with the Trump endorsements. In some cases, voters going in their own direction uh, and the biggest name of the night to go down uh, the, the first Republican uh, incumbent who wasn't opposed by another incumbent to go down this cycle will be Congressman Madison Cawthorn. All right Rick Klein our thanks to you of course our coverage not over but that is our show for this hour stay tuned to ABC News Live for more election coverage more context more analysis of the day's top stories I'm Lindsay Davis thanks so much for streaming with us. The black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risk my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. 
Tonight, President Biden in Buffalo paying his respects to the victims of the deadly mass shooting, condemning what he called a racist rampage, calling white supremacy a poison allowed to fester and grow in this country. The president and the first lady paying tribute to the 10 victims killed and the three people wounded in the deadly mass shooting at the Topps Market. All of the victims killed were black. The president honoring them going name by name, sharing their stories one by one, calling the racist attack an act of domestic terrorism, promising evil will not win. And he called out those in media and politics who he says are fueling some of this for profit. Mary Bruce standing by at the White House. The fast-moving investigation authorities tonight revealing disturbing new details about this 589-page document that they say the alleged gunman posted online, including the hate-filled plot to target black victims. That document appearing to show the suspect also wrote about abusing animals and the cache of weapons hidden in his bedroom. Tonight, new insight. What did his parents know and who else had access to his post? Stephanie Ramos in Buffalo. Chilling new details tonight about a deadly plane crash. Authorities now say one of the pilots intentionally crashed the plane. Sources confirming the flight data suggests one of the pilots intentionally put the passenger jet into a fatal nosedive, slamming into a mountain in China, killing all 132 people on board. The alarming new headline tonight amid this nationwide baby formula shortage, now two children hospitalized in Tennessee. Doctors now saying their bodies did not tolerate the switch to a different formula. The pandemic tonight and the FDA now authorizing Pfizer booster shots for children ages 5 to 11. The CDC likely to follow. Could boosters for younger children now be available within days? The unexplained mysteries in the sky for the first time in more than 50 years. Congress holding a hearing on UFOs, revealing how many military encounters in the sky that are still not explained. And a new round of severe storms tonight. Several states right now on alert for possible tornadoes, damaging winds and hail, record triple digit heat in Texas, and now soaring temperatures moving into the Northeast. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to have you with us here on a Tuesday night. And we begin tonight with President Biden and the First Lady in Buffalo, where 10 lives were taken in an attack authorities say was driven by racist hate. The president spending more than an hour and a half meeting with the families today and then speaking to the country, condemning racism, white supremacy, calling it a poison, saying no more, and calling out those in the media and politics who the president says are giving this hate oxygen for political gain and for profit. The president and first lady paying their respects at this makeshift memorial that continues to grow tonight. The president later speaking before the nation, giving the microphone to the first lady, Jill Biden, first. She spoke about the horror and her message to the families. The president meeting with local leaders outside the Topps Market and after meeting privately with the grieving families, then telling the American people that this was a murderous, racist rampage that brought so much pain, calling it domestic terrorism. ABC senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce leading us off tonight. In Buffalo today, President Biden visiting the site of what he called a murderous racist rampage, spending over an hour and a half meeting with the families of the 10 people killed, emotionally remembering the victims one by one. Andre McNeil, 53, worked at a restaurant, went to buy his three-year-old son a birthday cake. His son's selling a birthday, asking where's daddy. <clears throat> the president, blunt. What happened here is simple and straightforward. Terrorism. Terrorism. Domestic terrorism. Violence inflicted in the service of hate. The president calling out those who espouse replacement theory, the racist belief allegedly embraced by the shooting suspect that there is a conspiracy to replace white Americans with people of color. A hate that through the media and politics, the internet, has radicalized, angry, alienated, lost, and isolated individuals into falsely believing that they will be replaced. Biden assailing the politicians and members of the media who amplify the bigoted ideology. And I condemn those who spread the lie for power, political gain, and for profit. White supremacy is a poison. It's a poison. 
running through it really is. Running through our body politic. And it's been allowed to fester and grow right in front of our eyes. The president declaring this hate cannot be the story of our time. We have to refuse to live in a country where black people going about a weekly grocery shopping can be gunned down by weapons of war deployed in a racist cause. And Mary Bruce joined us tonight from the White House. And Mary, another president now comforting the nation after another horrific mass shooting in America. And we took note today while watching this together that he gave the microphone to First Lady Dr. Jill Biden first. David, the First Lady by the president's side throughout the day, visiting the memorial and meeting with the victims' families. And before the president spoke, she thanked them for, quote, opening up your hearts to us. The First Lady visibly emotional, saying they too know what it's like to lose a piece of your soul. David. All right, Mary Bruce leading us off here. In meantime, the investigation tonight, troubling new revelations from documents posted on social media and now obtained by ABC News. Authorities believe written by the gunman and new insight into whether his parents had any idea this plot was in the works. ABC Stephanie Ramos in Buffalo again tonight. Tonight, as the president and first lady paid their respects to the 10 victims killed here in Buffalo, officials again calling the attack on a Topps supermarket premeditated evil. The level of hatred in the heart and head of this individual is, is stunning. This as more details emerge from a 589 page document containing posts the suspect allegedly wrote on the social media platform Discord. Authorities say the document shows how 18 year old Peyton Gendron carefully plotted the attack for several months, first visiting the grocery store on March 8th, where he was questioned by a store security guard. That document also including sketches of the supermarket with outlines of various aisles that he could navigate around quickly. The suspect also allegedly describing the market as the first location he would strike, then black people walking down the street and another store down the road. And tonight, that document also appearing to show that the 18-year-old took part in animal abuse. In posts, the suspect alleging that his mother gave him a box to bury a cat he killed. Sources tell ABC News that some of those posts on Discord were made in a private group. It's unclear who had access to the posts or who saw them. And tonight, we're learning more about this woman, Julie Harwell. <laughs> seen on the ground completely distraught. Her partner and their eight-year-old daughter in a different part of the store when the gunfire erupted, fearing the worst. Well, first you just, you hear the gunshots, and then I, I look down the aisle, I see all the people running, so I just grab my daughter, ran in the back. The family finally reunited 20 minutes later. Harwell speaking with our affiliate WKBW. That was the most longest way I've ever had in my life. And tonight, this supermarket in the heart of this tight-knit, historically black neighborhood, an oasis in what used to be a food desert, remains closed amid the investigation. And Stephanie Ramos in Buffalo again tonight. Stephanie, that document appearing to shed some light now on whether the suspect may have hid his plans from his parents. Yes, David, authorities are looking through hundreds of messages they say the suspect posted online. He appears to write about how his parents had no idea he was collecting powerful weapons in his bedroom and that he was selling and buying silver coins to finance his ammo purchases. We do know the FBI has spoken to his parents. David. All right, Stephanie, thank you. Now to the other deadly mass shooting, this one at a California church tonight. The 68-year-old suspect has now been arraigned on state charges. The FBI has now launched a hate crimes investigation. 68-year-old David Chow, a U.S. citizen born in China, now charged with 10 counts, including murder. Authorities say as the congregation gathered, the suspect secured the doors, placed Molotov cocktails, and then opened fire, killing one, injuring five others. Prisoners fought back, pinning him down, and then tying him up. Authorities say Chow had a grievance against Taiwan, calling this a politically motivated hate crime. The FBI tonight also opening a hate crimes investigation after a shooting at a Korean-owned hair salon in Dallas. Police arresting Jeremy Smith for last week's attack. The arrest warrant claiming he had, quote, delusions about Asian Americans harming him. Three Korean women were wounded in the attack. Investigators are now looking for possible links to other recent shootings at Asian-run businesses. Overseas tonight into a chilling new report, authorities believe a pilot deliberately steered a passenger jet into a mountain in China. This comes from the investigation into the China Eastern passenger jet that plunged to earth earlier this year, killing 132. 
Sources telling ABC News the black boxes reveal that one of the pilots may have intentionally crashed that plane. ABC's Gio Benitez covers aviation. Tonight, in a story first reported by the Wall Street Journal, investigators now believe the 737 that slammed into a mountain in China last March was deliberately crashed. Sources confirming to ABC News that officials analyzing the flight data say it clearly points to someone in the cockpit intentionally pushing the plane into a fatal nosedive. All 132 people on board were killed. Experts also cite evidence that the plane's landing gear was never deployed and the flaps were not engaged, both of which would have happened if the pilot or co-pilot was trying to land the plane. Investigators believe the near vertical descent, as seen in this video, would have required intentional force. If you see a dive like this, that means somebody is forcing that airplane over. That's what indicates that this was not an accident. According to officials, investigators also looked into the personal life and background of one of the pilots and believe he may have been struggling through certain issues that remain undisclosed right before the crash. The new details, a chilling reminder of the German wings horror in 2015, the co-pilot locking the other pilot out of the cockpit and bringing down the Airbus A320 in the French Alps, killing 150 people. That co-pilot had been previously treated for suicidal tendency. The most chilling aspect of this, even just with the initial speculation that it might have been a pilot who wanted to kill himself and take everybody else with him, is that it has happened before. Now, we've got to be much more aggressive now in the international community in finding out how we can make sure it never, ever happens again. And David, China has not publicly said what it believes caused this crash. And tonight, Boeing does not believe there is any mechanical problem with its 737 jets in service around the world. David. Gio Benitez tonight. Gio, thank you. This evening, there was also a troubling new development in the baby formula supply crisis. We have learned this evening that two children were hospitalized in Tennessee after they were fed alternatives to the specialized formula they need and that their parents could not find. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, a dire consequence of that nationwide shortage. Two children hospitalized in Tennessee after their parents were forced to find an alternative to their specialized formula made by Abbott. They were dehydrated. I mean, they, they needed fluid. And again, because these kids have short bowel, it's not like you can just give them rehydration fluids orally. They needed IV hydration. Doctors say the toddler and preschooler from two different families needed that special type of formula because of intestinal conditions. Both kids had an adverse reaction to a non-Abbott brand and blend. The hospital has run out of the formula they need, so they are treating one patient with fluids. The other patient was released after doctors adapted a formula designed for adults. We had to take a formula that's not really, really you know, designed for what we're using it for, and we've had to create um, some additions. The base is an adult formula uh, and alter it to where it will work for the patient. The Abbott plant that makes specialized formulas may reopen in two weeks after an agreement with the FDA, but it would take up to two more months to get their products onto shelves. And while the FDA is moving to import brands of formula not currently sold in the U.S., that could also take weeks. And doctors say that changing formula for most kids is okay, but as we have seen for some kids with special health concerns, they may not be able to tolerate another formula. So doctors say that you should speak with your pediatrician or treating physicians to explore every option. David. Yeah, this was really alarming to hear today. Ariel, thank you. There's also news on COVID tonight. The FDA has now authorized booster shots of the Pfizer vaccine for children 5 to 11. The CDC expected to issue guidance later this week. Many doctors remain concerned because more than 70% of 5 to 11-year-olds haven't been fully vaccinated. And new child COVID infections are now at their highest point since February. And hospital admissions now up 57% in just the last month. And tonight in New York City, the city is now at a high risk alert level because of what we're seeing here with increased pressure on the health care system. For now, masks indoors are recommended, but not required. To Capitol Hill in the first congressional hearing in half a century on what the military calls unidentified aerial phenomena, what the rest of us call UFOs, and hundreds of military encounters still unexplained tonight. Here's Terry Moran. The military calls them unidentified aerial phenomena, UFOs in other words. Oh my gosh. They've mystified us for decades, but they also may be a real national security concern. 
Today, a House Intelligence Subcommittee held the first congressional hearing on these close encounters in more than half a century. We want to know what's out there as much as you want to know what's out there. Pentagon officials now say there have been close to 400 military encounters with things in the sky they cannot currently explain. That's up from 144 reported last year. Pentagon officials avoided speculation but admitted how baffling this uh, is. I, I can't point to something that definitively was not uh, man-made, but I can point to a number of examples in which remain unresolved. Some incidents have been debunked, like this famous so-called pyramid video leaked in 2021. Oh, it's getting close. Officials couldn't explain it at the time, but they now say it's drones in the sky distorted by a night vision lens to look like flying pyramids. The Pentagon says it wants to destigmatize the whole issue of these UFOs in order to encourage more pilots and other military personnel to report whatever it is they're seeing in the skies above America. David? Really fascinating. Terry Moran in Washington. Terry, thank you. To the war in Ukraine tonight, despite Vladimir Putin's threats of retaliation, both Finland and Sweden announcing that they will jointly submit their applications for NATO membership tomorrow. And tonight here, new images of those injured Ukrainian fighters, more than 200 evacuated from the steel plant in Mariupol. Russia tonight calling it a surrender, Ukraine calling it a prisoner swap, and President Zelensky praising those soldiers for their heroic resistance. When we come back here, the breaking headline coming in, rescuers trying to save teenagers trapped in a sand collapse on the beach. We're also tracking severe storms, potentially damaging winds in the coming hours here. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Tonight, emergency crews are on the scene of a beach rescue in Toms River, New Jersey. The image is coming in now. Authorities say the teens, a boy and a girl, were digging a 10-foot hole in the sand when it collapsed on them. Reports say one of the teens has been pulled free. The other remained trapped for a time. We have learned tonight the other did not survive. Authorities nationwide have warned of the dangers of digging those holes on the beach because of collapsing fears. When we come back here tonight, tracking those severe storms set to hit this evening and intense heat moving into the east. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. 
To the index and tonight we're tracking a new round of severe storms moving into the Midwest. Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa and Missouri all at risk for possible tornadoes, dangerous winds and hail and enhanced risk in several areas including Kansas City, Omaha and Lincoln, Nebraska. Texas reporting record triple digit heat. Dallas topping 90 degrees for the 10th day in a row. Intense heat moving into the northeast by the weekend. High 80s and 90s expected. When we come back here, the image that defines this day. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Tomorrow morning, Michael Strahan takes you into the land of fire and ice. Live from breathtaking Iceland. Yeah! Let's do it. Tomorrow, only on GMA. Before we go tonight, the images of another president and first lady paying their respects after a mass shooting in America. President Biden, his hand to his heart, the first lady by his side, offering a prayer at the growing makeshift memorial in Buffalo. Another American president consoling a community. President Biden telling grieving families and neighbors, we are here to stand with you, grieve with you. The first lady thanked them for allowing them to come pay their respects. I'm David Muir. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Good night. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Five states, five primary elections, dozens of high stakes races. I felt he, you know, definitely has Pennsylvania's people at heart, and that was important to me. I, I actually had to take a little bit of time off from work to vote because it's important that everybody get and vote. In particular, the last couple of years, it's become really ugly. So if you're not counted, you're in trouble. 
From Pennsylvania, where the GOP race for Senate has the party at odds. I just cast the vote for myself, which is not a humble thing to do, but it's what I'm humbling asking all Pennsylvanians to do. Will voters cast their ballot for a celebrity physician turned Trump endorsee, a far-right Republican, or a conservative businessman? No one knows the, the issues and the people of Pennsylvania like I do. The Democratic race marred by health issues. The candidate with a healthy lead casting his vote from a hospital bed today. And to North Carolina, after a series of missteps, will Republican Congressman Madison Cawthorn hold on to his seat? And a former American Idol contestant looking to join Congress. Tonight, ABC News Live brings you full context and analysis. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us at this hour. Polls across five states, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Kentucky, Idaho, and Oregon, are now closed. Voters have made their voices heard with some of America's most divisive issues front and center. Inflation, of course, a huge concern for many. The explosive issue of abortion also resurfacing in recent weeks and now another deadly mass shooting reminding voters of the scourge of gun violence in America and our inability to curb it. Earlier today, President Biden went to Buffalo where he forcefully condemned white supremacy after that attack that officials say was inspired by hate. We'll have more on that in a moment, but for much of this evening, here on ABC News Live, of course, our focus has been the midterm primaries tonight. ABC News can confirm the first incumbent, you see him right there, backed by President Trump, Madison Cawthorn, has now conceded after battling months of controversy. But most political observers have been keeping a close eye on the Pennsylvania Senate races. At this hour, the race between celebrity physician Dr. Mehmet Oz and hedge fund CEO Dave McCormick, still a close one virtually neck and neck. Here is where things stand at this hour. Take a look. 32% to 31%, a split of about just 3,000 votes so far, with 73% of the expected vote reporting at this time. Kathy Barnett not playing as much of a role as many people said, as uh, Dr. Ra said, that perhaps she had already had her time in the sun tonight. Uh, she's there right now in third place with still about 25% of the vote uh, still to come in. Meanwhile, across the aisle, Democrats face an entirely different dynamic despite a health scare. Popular everyman candidate and Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman has been projected to win his race for the Senate there while he's in the hospital tonight. And now let's go to Fetterman headquarters where his wife spoke in uh, Pennsylvania tonight. Let's take a listen. Before he was Pennsylvania's next senator, he wants to know the people he's serving. He feels a responsibility to each and every one of them. And he fights for people like he'd fight for a neighbor, like he'd fight for his family. That is what makes John different. And that is what makes him tough enough to fight for Pennsylvania. He did it in Braddock. He did it in Harrisburg. And now he's going to do the same thing in Washington. We got a chance to speak one-on-one -on -one with Giselle earlier this evening. She talked about uh, her husband's prognosis after having that pacemaker uh, surgery tonight. She says that he is expected to be well, that uh, he's already beginning the recovery process, and we'll have more uh, on the status of the primary elections tonight in just a little bit. But first, we want to switch gears now and talk about Buffalo. Of course, President Biden and the First Lady visited that heartbroken city today where 10 lives were taken in an attack that authorities say were driven by racist hate. The president met with families and then addressed the nation with very forceful words condemning racist theories. ABC's Mary Bruce has this report for us. In Buffalo today, President Biden visiting the site of what he called a murderous racist rampage, spending over an hour and a half meeting with the families of the 10 people killed, emotionally remembering the victims one by one. Andre McNeil, 53, worked at a restaurant went to buy his three-year-old son a birthday cake. <clears throat> his son's selling a birthday, asking where's daddy. <clears throat> the president, blunt. What happened here is simple and straightforward. Terrorism. Terrorism. Domestic terrorism. Violence inflicted in the service of hate. 
The president calling out those who espouse replacement theory, the racist belief allegedly embraced by the shooting suspect that there is a conspiracy to replace white Americans with people of color. I hate that through the media and politics, the Internet, has radicalized, angry, alienated, lost, and isolated individuals into falsely believing that they will be replaced. Biden assailing the politicians and members of the media who amplify the bigoted ideology. And I condemn those who spread the lie for power, political gain, and for profit. White supremacy is a poison. It's a poison <laughs> running through our, it really is. running through our body politic, and it's been allowed to fester and grow right in front of our eyes. The president declaring this hate cannot be the story of our time. We have to refuse to live in a country where black people going about a weekly grocery shopping can be gunned down by weapons of war deployed in a racist cause. Some strong words there from President Biden. Our thanks to Mary Bruce for that. Now to the investigation into the supermarket massacre. The community continues to try to pick up the pieces as we learn more about what officials have called a detailed and premeditated plan of attack. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has more. Tonight, as the president and first lady paid their respects to the 10 victims killed here in Buffalo, officials again calling the attack on a Topps supermarket premeditated evil. The level of hatred in the heart and head of this individual is, is stunning. This as more details emerge from a 589 page document containing posts the suspect allegedly wrote on the social media platform Discord. Authorities say the document shows how 18 year old Peyton Gendron carefully plotted the attack for several months, first visiting the grocery store on March 8th, where he was questioned by a store security guard. That document also including sketches of the supermarket with outlines of various aisles that he could navigate around quickly. The suspect also allegedly describing the market as the first location he would strike, then black people walking down the street and another store down the road. And tonight, that document also appearing to show that the 18-year-old took part in animal abuse. In posts, the suspect alleging that his mother gave him a box to bury a cat he killed. Sources tell ABC News that some of those posts on Discord were made in a private group. It's unclear who had access to the posts or who saw them. And tonight, we're learning more about this woman, Julie Harwell. <laughs> seen on the ground completely distraught. Her partner and their eight-year-old daughter in a different part of the store when the gunfire erupted, fearing the worst. Well, first you just, you hear the gunshots, and then I, I look down the aisle, I see all the people running, so I just grab my daughter, ran in the back. The family finally reunited 20 minutes later. Harwell speaking with our affiliate WKBW. That was the most longest way I've ever had in my life. And tonight, this supermarket in the heart of this tight-knit, historically black neighborhood, an oasis in what used to be a food desert, remains closed amid the investigation. Joining us once again is Buffalo Mayor Byron Brown. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us again tonight. You got to meet with President Biden today. President came with a very forceful message. He used words like racist rampage and domestic terrorism. Yesterday when we spoke, you said something needed to be done at the federal level. Did you discuss with the president any possible options moving forward to see if we can finally try to get this two-headed monster of guns and hate under control? I think the president is very resolved to get something done about guns and hate in this country. Uh, the president spoke very forcefully. The president was very moved, it appeared, from his meeting uh, with families. Uh, the meeting went very well. The president and first lady spent a considerable amount of time uh, with the family of the 10 victims of this horrible violence in the city of Buffalo, where 10 precious lives were taken, uh, were stolen uh, by a racist gunman who wanted to take black lives. In the past decade or so, um, whoever has been really in the position of president, they've had to take on the role of healer in chief. Do you feel that your community um, has, has 
is feeling better um, and authentically seen by the president after this visit? A lot of pain still in this community, a lot of anger, a lot of hurt. I think the community uh, did feel comforted by the president's uh, being here, by the first lady being here, certainly felt his sincerity and his desire to help this community heal and to do something meaningful to stop mass shootings in this country. This mass shooting uh, motivated by uh, racial hatred, uh, but so many mass shootings over the past several years, hundreds of mass shootings, and the president uh, seemed incredibly resolved and incredibly focused on working to get something meaningful done. I'd love to ask you as well, as the leader of this city, the second largest in the state of New York, what are some of your long-term plans to try to make your city safer, regardless of whether the state or federal authorities do anything at all? Uh, always very focused on making this community safer. In the budget that I propose for 2022-2023, we've increased uh, the budget for public safety, for police and fire, um, adding more detectives to the uh, Buffalo Police Department budget, uh, expanding the behavioral health team uh, that uh, works and responds uh, to mental health calls with clinicians, uh, money for shot spotter technology, a gunshot detection system, and other resources to support the work of our police department uh, and resources for our fire department that I didn't enumerate uh, but listed in this budget. So we are very focused on public safety. We think public safety is, is critical. We want to make sure that our children are safe going to school, uh, that people are safe going to church, that our business districts uh, where people shop and where people work are safe, so uh, we will continue to make uh, a commitment to strong, professional, respectful public safety in the city of Buffalo. Still a lot of open wounds we know in your city. Buffalo Mayor Byron Brown, we thank you so much for joining us once again tonight. Thank you very much. Back to our primary election night coverage. Here is where things stand at this hour. Taking a look at the state of Pennsylvania, they're neck and neck, 31% tied. Uh, Dave McCormick with Dr. Mehmet Oz. You see just um, about uh, less than 2,000 votes separating the two. Dave McCormick taking a slight lead and Kathy Barnett in third place there with 24% of the vote. You have nearly 80% of the votes that have been tabulated at this point. And now let's go to ABC News correspondent Alex Perche inside the campaign headquarters of Dr. Mehmet Oz. Alex, uh, Dr. Oz got that highly coveted Trump endorsement, but it doesn't seem like that was enough necessarily to overwhelmingly at least convince Pennsylvania Republicans to back him and as a result we're watching this tight race play out tonight talk to us about the energy that you're seeing there at his campaign headquarters Lindsay, it, it, it kind of reminds me of, of watching a, a tightly contested playoff basketball game, right? I mean, your team is down by by a, by a bucket. There's less than a minute left to go, and and you have possession. I mean, that's that's what we're kind of seeing here. The, the the level of intensity. This is the first time, uh, probably in the last 15 minutes, that we've actually heard this crowd erupt into cheers as they're watching these nu uh, these numbers come in. They're about to give an update here. You hear them right now reacting to the news uh, but there is there is definitely there's definitely a high energy here in this room and we've seen it kind of progress through the night especially whenever you consider how this night started with David McCormick jumping out to such a high lead or a, a, a fast lead and uh, the Oz campaign kind of closing in there but look I mean this has been a, a, a highly contested a highly personal uh, uh, campaign we've seen a lot of personal attacks between 
the top three candidates here. Uh, and you mentioned Dr. Oz getting that Trump endorsement. Well, one of the things that did, yes, it did boost his numbers, but it also made him a target in this race. And so you've seen a lot of his uh, competition really kind of target him uh, in their ads uh, and, and, and certainly in a lot of the messaging uh, going after him. And, and so, listen, I mean, this for this crowd, uh, seeing him kind of close in has been huge tonight. They certainly close in, but I was going to say, based on your analogy, it didn't seem like he has possession with the minute left on the clock, though it, it seems like the room is reading it differently and we're seeing people kind of on their toes and, and applauding back there. Uh, so to be continued, we'll see if it goes into overtime tonight. But uh, tell us about McCormick. He wasn't endorsed by the former president, despite the fact that, that his wife served in the Trump administration. Of course, he was looking for that highly coveted endorsement from the former president. Uh, that's right, Lindsay. And, and so what's been interesting is we got a chance to talk with David McCormick earlier today, and I asked him specifically about how this Trump endorsement is playing out in this race. And he, he walked a delicate line, saying that, well, of course the former president's endorsement matters, but he didn't think that it would impact this race tremendously. Uh, and then he kind of pivoted to how he sees himself as a different candidate than Dr. Oz. But one thing that he did bring up uh, is the issues in this race. Certainly there have been a lot of personal attacks. Certainly uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, people's records and, and, and where they're from. But uh, McCormick really kind of uh, focused in on, on the issues that he thought were going to resonate with Pennsylvania voters. Chief among them uh, was inflation. Uh, and then authenticity was something that he brought up uh, on the character side. And I, I got to say, Lindsay, in our anecdotal you know, surveying of, of Republicans, here over the last couple of days, they have been focused specifically on issues. It's less so about the ads. It's less so uh, about some of the, uh, the the headlines that have emerged about these candidates. Uh, I talked to a mother of a two-year-old yesterday who said that crime and the economy were her top two voting issues in this race. And and, and one other thing that I would point out, Lindsay, as this race is neck and neck. You mentioned 2,000 votes. Keep an eye on Lancaster County. Lancaster County, for the Secretary of State, uh, had about 22,000 mail ballots that were printed with the wrong code, and so they couldn't be read by the scanners. And so county election officials will be remarking them. It's legal here in Pennsylvania. It's a legal process, but that process could take days. Again, we might actually have something definitive later tonight, but considering how tight this race is right now, that might be something to watch. We might actually go into that over time is it to continue to, to beat your analogy to, to a dead horse. Alex Brashe, our, our thanks to you. Meanwhile, across the aisle, Democrats face an entirely different dynamic. Despite a health scare, popular everyman candidate and Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman has been projected to win his race for the Senate there. Let's go to Fetterman headquarters where his wife spoke in his place tonight and will bring back in senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer. Uh, you've been, of course, following this race for us on ABC News Live for uh, a considerable amount of time at this point as his campaign now moves to a general election. Could Fetterman serve as a model for Democrats trying to really uh, appeal increasingly to, to populist GOP voters? Well, the general election, Lindsay, with starts tomorrow. And by the way, they're pulling the bunting down behind me. Get ready. This race is going to be a blockbuster. It's going to test that proposition you raised. Is John Fetterman going to be a model for Democrats? Uh, we'll wait and see. Democrats in this swing state of Pennsylvania, with lots of Trump energy, made a big resounding decision today. And they said that those consensus, compromise, moderate candidates uh, in this state should be out. And instead, for Democrats, a bold and anti-establishment, um, an atypical candidate, if you will, should be in. Someone like John Fetterman uh, with his resounding victory today. One strategist told me, Lindsay, this is a siren for Democrats in this state. Democrats are ready to break the mold. He said, and they certainly have done that with this candidate. We've talked about it tonight. John Fetterman, the lieutenant governor, six foot nine, tattoo, uh, bald headed guy, uh, father of three, curses on the campaign trail. He's not your typical cookie cutter Senate cutout. Um, and they are hoping that someone who sort of speaks that language is the everyman will be successful. Um, and I heard today, Lindsay, from a lot.
lot of voters, a lot of Democratic voters, that they are frustrated with Washington. They're frustrated with the way things are. So we see that reflected in this candidate tonight. Uh, the, certainly the party has had some difficulty courting white working class voters, and they're going to make a big play here in Pennsylvania. They know this race, this Senate seat is the one that not only could, you know, help them win back a seat from Republicans, but determine control of the United States Senate next year. Uh, a, a huge, huge stakes there as well as, you know, not just for the president's agenda, uh, but for uh, for those nominations and cabinet appointments, maybe even another Supreme Court pick if that comes in the next few years. So a lot riding on this race here, Lindsay. And Fetterman, of course, with his trademark hoodie and, and shorts, he didn't even wait for tonight, really, to begin those attacks on uh, Republican opponents, anticipating his victory. He was already uh, planning for this in advance and already acting on it. Uh, this race, as you mentioned, so critical for Democrats. It's perhaps their best opportunity to pick up a seat from the GOP and keep control of the Senate. I have to imagine millions of dollars will now pour into this campaign. Yeah, this race is expected to be not just the most expensive and hotly contested, uh, but the decisive race, perhaps, of this election cycle. And in fact, you talk about money. Uh, just minutes after John Fetterman was projected to win this race, he sent out a fundraising email. And as his words, Lindsay, we need we need big money. We need to raise a lot of money tonight. So already that fundraising is underway. And make no mistake, whoever the Republican nominee will be doing the same thing starting tomorrow. Uh, we've talked about the stakes. 50-50 Senate already so difficult for Democrats and for the Biden agenda. Uh, so they realize how much is on the line here, and they're ready to fight for it tonight. We heard it from John Fetterman's uh, wife, who, by the way, Giselle, you talked to her. She's still roaming around here, waiting to the bitter end of this party, thanking every volunteer. Uh, but tomorrow the fight will be on. It's going to be a brutal fight here in Pennsylvania, Lindsay. All right, and of course, on the opposite side, Ted Budd, he had gotten that funding uh, from, from the group of, uh, for growth, uh, $15 million, so we can anticipate just how much money is going to be spent on both sides. Thank you so much, Devin. Appreciate you hanging with us all night. Thanks, Let's Lizzie. turn now to North Carolina, where there are several House races getting national attention in the state's 11th district and battled first-term Congressman Madison Cawthorn. As we mentioned, he lost his fight to keep his seat after several scandals over the past few months. He has now conceded his race. Take a look there. Chuck Edwards with 33% of the vote. Madison Cawthorn right behind him with 32%. And in the 13th district for the Democrats, a two-term state senator, Wiley Nickel, who worked with President Obama, victorious there, getting more than half of the vote there in House District 13 in North Carolina. And in a stacked Democratic race, a former American Idol star on the ballot, Clay Aiken, uh, not able to squeak out even to 10% of the vote, not able to get to double digits there with just 7%, of course, uh, Valerie Fouché, uh, who was expected to win, has done just that with 46% of the vote, still 84% of the vote reporting in at this point. Let's bring back in ABC News political director Rick Klein. And, and Rick, let's really drill down more on that Pennsylvania race, a dead heat where, where are both candidates looking strong at this hour? Yeah, Lindsay, I mean, you're seeing you're seeing a different coalition from the three major Republican candidates. And maybe the surprise is that Kathy Barnett isn't in the top two, but there's a lot of signs that she cut into the vote totals that maybe Dr. Oz would have otherwise seen. Now, let me explain what I mean. Right now, we're seeing Dr. Oz run particularly well in some of the Trump-heavy counties up here, the Lehigh Valley up in northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, that was Trump country uh, uh, four, uh, two years ago, and it's right now Dr. Oz country, but it's not by an overwhelming margin. I mean, at the same time, you see in, in Dave McCormick, a lot of strength here in Western Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area, more of a Democratic area, and maybe more of a Trump skeptical Republican base. Uh, and meanwhile, you also are seeing a pretty big, good, good bit of strength for Kathy Barnett here outside Philadelphia area. And wh why, why that's interesting is because that's the part of the state where there's a lot of votes still outstanding. About 40% of the vote, according to our team, still outstanding from that part of the state. And it's, it's sharply divided, split between three candidates. So it's hard to make up ground in a substantial way. That's why we're looking at a race right now that is very close. As, as those votes continue to come in, it looks like it's, it's possible that Kathy Barnett and that late surge may have eaten into the margin that Dr. Oz would have had, that Trump supporters have, have split their vote between those two candidates, and that Dave McCormick is the unlikely beneficiary. He's the guy that was attacked by President Trump. He's also someone that has bragged about being close to Trump uh, and, 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 and trying to burnish those, those MAGA credentials, uh, but he may kind of slide through this race uh, because he wasn't the Trump candidate. There's some weird machinations going on that we're starting to see, out, see play out in a very close state tonight.
And we have talked so much about the power of Trump's endorsements, but one of his biggest allies in Congress lost his seat tonight. Yeah, and this is, a, this is a surprise. I mean, we always talk about how important that Trump endorsement is, and we heard from lots of uh, congressmen on our air tonight about everyone wanting it. Well, Madison Cawthorn got it. Not only did he get it, Donald Trump was one of the last major Republicans standing that was willing to vouch for a man that has had repeated legal troubles, uh, scandals, uh, almost the entire delegation of senators in his state. They all distanced themselves from him. But Trump said, give the kid another chance. Uh, give this 26-year-old another opportunity. He had been featured at his convention, considered a rising star. That star has fallen in a major way. The biggest name so far to, to lose. And again, losing in Trump country. This is a part of the state that's very Republican, very conservative, a very loyal Loyal to, to, to former President Trump, would it appear that those voters are just sick of the drama and, and they're going in another direction. And, and let's talk about the Democratic Party for a moment. Lieutenant Governor uh, John Fetterman winning the Pennsylvania primary from his hospital bed. Sherry Beasley of North Carolina pulling out a win in that state. Uh, what do these results tell us about where that party might be going? I mean, look at look at the nominees that we're going to have in all three of these states right here. Uh, Charles Booker in Kentucky, a black man in North Carolina. Sherry Beasley, a, a black woman who's a former Supreme Court justice in the state of North Carolina. And a lot, we were talking tonight about, about John Fetterman. These are three people that don't look like a lot of other United States senators. And they don't look like anyone's idea of a, of a typical Washington politician. Look, Democrats may not be successful in, in any or all of these races, but tonight, Combine, combine that with the, the nomination of Tim Ryan a couple weeks ago. Democrats are pretty happy with the, the, the people that they're putting on the playing field. They feel like this speaks to a new generation, a younger than, than, than most United States senators, and people that have different backgrounds, different experiences, that look and are different than what's been put forward before in a year where uh, voters want a lot of change. All right, Rick Klein, our thanks to you. Thank you for hanging with us all night. And now to Pennsylvania's primary race for governor. Republicans are the only contested race here. State Senator Doug Mastriano has been leading the polls in the Pennsylvania governor Republican primary. ABC News projects Doug Mastriano will win. Of course, he was also endorsed by former President Trump Mastriano, far-right 2020 election denier. He spoke just a few minutes ago. Take a listen. Take a couple days off. And then the great adventure continues until ultimate victory on November 8th when we return to Pennsylvania Keystone State around and put it back in the hands of the people. Thank you and God bless you guys. Let's bring in our ABC News director, political uh, deputy director, Avery Harper. Avery, Mastriano became a, a central figure in former President Trump's efforts in overturning the election. Uh, what does it say about the Republican Party's views on the big lie? Well, it certainly says that it's not disqualifying. In fact, it says it was preferred in this race, and, and that is definitely a win uh, for former President Trump uh, in, in this primary. Uh, it's important to remember that should Doug Mastriano win in November, he'll also get to a point uh, whoever's going to be the Secretary of State, the person who runs elections in the Commonwealth of, of Pennsylvania. And all signs point to uh, him choosing someone uh, who would espouse the same election lies as he does. So that's something that voters in Pennsylvania are going to have to think about as they head to the polls in November. And the Democratic nominee, Josh Shapiro, Pennsylvania's Attorney General, he ran unopposed. What does a matchup between these two look like? Well, uh, Shapiro is in COVID quarantine, but he issued a statement tonight uh, talking about uh, the fact that uh, Doug Mastriano was uh, projected to be winning this race. And I'll just read from it. He says that uh, Republicans just nominated a dangerous extremist who wants to take away our freedoms. Uh, so if that is any indication, this is likely to be a, a fight to the finish in November. Uh, what I'm really interested to see is if Mastriano uh, makes any attempts to uh, come to the middle. Uh, there had been concerns from Republicans uh, in the Commonwealth that he uh, would not be able to appeal to uh, maybe independent voters or uh, Democratic voters who might be unsatisfied uh, with the Biden administration. And, and for Shapiro, Shapiro is going to have to deal and combat the fact that there are folks who are uh, dissatisfied with the Biden administration. And we know that history is not necessarily on the side of the uh, party who is in the White House. And in that case, uh, it is Democrats. So we're just going to have to wait and see. November is right around the corner. It'll be here before you know it.
it. <laughs> Avery Harper, our thanks to you. And when we come back, Amber Heard grilled during cross-examination. Once again, we have the latest. The Buffalo carnage has reminded us all of our society's challenges with guns, but in major cities, it's a daily struggle. Coming up, our conversation with the Philadelphia Police Commissioner. What should we be thinking about if we want to get serious about stopping the bloodshed in our communities? But up next, the truth is out there, so they say. But did we get closer to learning what the truth is during a hearing today about so-called UFOs in Congress? More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. <laughs> Story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Welcome back now to the search for answers to the unexplained, a series of unidentified aerial phenomena spotted by military pilots, or what most of us call UFOs. Congress held a hearing on them for the first time in more than 50 years today. ABC's Terry Moran has this report. The military calls them unidentified aerial phenomena, UFOs in other words. My gosh. They've mystified us for decades, but they also may be a real national security concern. Today, a House Intelligence Subcommittee held the first congressional hearing on these close encounters in more than half a century. We want to know what's out there as much as you want to know what's out there. Pentagon officials now say there have been close to 400 military encounters with things in the sky they cannot currently explain. That's up from 144 reported last year. Pentagon officials avoided speculation, but admitted how baffling this is. Uh, I, I can't point to something that definitively was not uh, man-made, but I can point to a number of examples in which remain unresolved. Some incidents have been debunked, like this famous so-called pyramid video leaked in 2021. Whoa, it's getting close. Look at that thing. Officials couldn't explain it at the time, but they now say it's drones in the sky, distorted by a night vision lens to look like flying pyramids. 
Some interesting intel there. Terry Moran joins us now. Terry, what's the ultimate goal of the Pentagon with these hearings and testimony? Lindsay, the first goal is to comply with really a congressional demand now to shine some, shine some sunlight on a subject that really has been shrouded in mystery and fantasy and speculation. And the military also really wants now the public and certainly everyone in the military to participate in a search for answers. They now know after analysis for decades that whatever they are looking at is not a, a flying object or a flying machine known to the United States of America. It is flying in ways that we cannot replicate and they can't determine what these things are. And so they want to encourage and destigmatize this whole issue of UFOs to bring it into the sunlight of uh, away from speculation and into research, observation, and hopefully at the end of the day, some answers. Lindsay? All really quite fascinating. Terry Moran, our thanks to you. Still ahead here on Prime is Elon Musk backing out of his Twitter takeover attempt. Gas prices at this point are straight out of control and they may be getting worse. We have the latest predictions. And where do so many of these guns used in these relentless mass shootings come from? We take a look by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day from Secretary of State Antony Blinken on this International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia. black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put people to your life like this. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risked my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. Welcome back, everyone. We know from the alleged Buffalo Shooters online racist diatribe detailing his plans that he had three guns and intended to continue his shooting rampage in the African-American community. We also know that he legally purchased two of the guns and his father bought the third as a gift for hunting. That led us to take a look at legally purchased guns and mass shootings by the numbers. From 1966 to 2019, 77% of mass shooters bought their guns legally, according to the Justice Department research. As for underage shooters, more than 80% stole weapons from family members. 2017, the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history, more than 50 killed. Talking, of course, about Las Vegas, the casino shooter, he legally purchased 33 guns in 12 months. 2018, the anti-Semitic extremist who killed 11 people at the Tree of Life Synagogue legally bought his weapon. 2019, a shooter at a Walmart in El Paso targeting Latinos killed more than 20 people. He legally bought his AK-47 online.
Many mass shooters actually favor semi-automatic weapons like AK-47s and AR-15s. They're used in 25% of mass shootings, but fewer than 1% of overall gun crime. Decades ago, mass shootings were more common at workplaces. More recently, schools and places of worship have become targets. But the one constant for more than 50 years is the vast majority of these horrific attacks have been committed with legally purchased weapons. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. We're learning new details in that other mass shooting over the weekend, the one inside a California church. Several popular candies are being recalled. We'll tell you why. But first, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. President Biden and the First Lady pausing in prayer at a moment of silence at a growing memorial outside Top Supermarket on the east side of Buffalo, New York. The president meeting with the victims' families, promising this country will stand by them in this time of mourning and condemning what he called a racist rampage. What happened here is simple and straightforward. Terrorism. Domestic terrorism. White supremacy is a poison. Oh my God, he shot so many people in there. A senior law enforcement source telling ABC alleged gunman 18-year-old Peyton Gendron self-radicalized in the pandemic, absorbing hate-filled social media posts and posting increasingly violent and racist rhetoric himself in the weeks leading up to Saturday's attack. The predominantly black community reeling over the 10 lives lost when police say Gendron stormed the supermarket armed with an AR-15 assault style rifle, live streaming the whole thing. And I watched the video. <laughs> he shot my mom once. My mom was, was, lay, was laying on the ground. He went and reloaded. <laughs> And he shot my mom again. The massacre renewing calls for greater gun control. Exclusive images, parishioners pinning to the ground the shooting suspect who opened fire on their congregation. Beside them, that knife. And to the right, that blurred image, the fallen Dr. John Cheng, one of several heroes of Sunday's church service shooting. The day had started with a celebration. About 50 people at the Taiwanese Presbyterian congregation welcoming back Pastor Billy Chang from Taiwan. The man police say opened fire, killing one person and wounding five, has been charged with one count of murder and five counts of premeditated attempted murder. The suspect, 68-year-old David Chow, could face the death penalty if convicted on all charges. 
Billionaire Elon Musk says he wants more information before moving forward with his proposed buyout of Twitter. In a filing with federal regulators, Twitter insisted that only about 5% of its accounts are fake or spam accounts, so-called bots. But potential new owner Elon Musk thinks the number is probably closer to 20%. He's demanding that Twitter provide evidence to back up its 5% estimate. While not a deal breaker, he says the purchase won't move forward until he sees proof. Well, for the first time ever, one state has topped $6 a gallon for gas. The average price for a gallon of regular unleaded gas in California is now $6.02. Five other states all along the West Coast have topped $5 a gallon. The national average right now sits about $4.52 a gallon, which is still an all-time high. The price of a barrel of oil is also on the rise now at $114. Several popular candies are being recalled. The maker of Skittles, Starburst, and Lifesavers gummies warning of a possible very thin metal strand embedded in some products or loose in the bag. The recall includes 13 products ranging from 3.5 ounce bags to 12 ounces. Customers should throw out the recalled packages. Queen Elizabeth making a surprise appearance at London's Paddington Station, the 96-year-old monarch on her feet with a cane in hand, visiting a subway line named in her honor. It's now just over two weeks until her platinum jubilee, celebrating her 70 years on the throne. Amber Heard was back on the stand today as cross-examination continued in the high-profile defamation trial between her and her ex-husband, Johnny Depp. The former couple was married from 2015 to 2017 and have lobbed abuse claims at each other during their individual testimonies. We do want to warn you that there is mention of sexual assault, which could be triggering for some. Our Janae Norman has this report. He's, he's, he knows he's lying. Otherwise, why can't he look at me? I survived. I survived that man and I'm here and I'm able to look at him. Amber Heard back on the stand for a second day of cross-examination in the multi-million dollar defamation suit filed by ex-husband Johnny Depp. That's become a case of he said, she said amid allegations of abuse by both sides. This is you and your friends at Coachella, correct? That is correct. There's no injuries to you. Are there, Ms. Heard, visible in this picture? You cannot see any visible injury, no. Heard testifying she suffered verbal, physical, and sexual abuse at the hands of Depp, detailing how she used makeup to cover bruises. Depp's lawyers looking to cast doubt on domestic abuse claims, accusing Heard of doctoring photos from May 2016 that appear to show bruising. Isn't it true you just edited these photographs? No, I've never edited a photograph. Didn't you just enhance the saturation for one of these photos to make your face look more red? Uh, no, that's incorrect. I didn't touch it. And pushing back with pictures of their own, showing images of her one day after she claims Depp broke her nose. Your nose doesn't appear to be injured in any of these pictures, does it, Miss Heard? That's why I'm wearing makeup. Right. And makeup covers up swelling, right? Makeup will not cover up swelling. I swell, though. Making the case that Depp is the real victim. I don't want a divorce. I never want a divorce. I never want a divorce. You came around the bed and start punching on me. On the stand, Heard testified to Depp's jealousy, which she said would lead to violence. Depp's team playing audio, attempting to show the jury it was Heard who was jealous. Is there no other place for you running your 15 other houses to go run? Come on, go be a real married man. Go deal with your the way that a man does. Go run to the next house. Every man does. Yeah. Go. Go on. run away. That's what I do. You're the most spoiled <laughs> And you've got everybody out here almost oh, full, but it don't right. last long. You're right. I've been here a lot longer you're than right. you. You're right. you got to figure it out. I yeah, because no one does oh, 21 man. drunk straight when they're in their 20s. No, you're right. That's not selling you out. You were the jealous one in this relationship, weren't you, Miss Heard? I think he was indicating I was jealous of his career. But now you've twisted it to say it was Mr. Depp. That's the jealous one. Johnny's always been very jealous when I worked, when I did anything, friends. Yes, he's always been very jealous. Depp's attorney returning to that infamous fight in 2015 in Australia, which allegedly left Depp with a severed finger, questioning why there were no medical records stemming from the alleged sexual assault, which Heard said left her bleeding. And there is not a single medical record reflecting treatment for any of those injuries. Is there, Ms. Heard? I didn't seek treatment. Asked whether she was responsible for any of the writing on the walls from that incident, Heard saying no, 
that it was all Depp. I can't promise you I won't get physical again. God, I sometimes get so mad and lose it. Playing audio recordings of their fights. You got physical with Mr. Depp often during your relationship, didn't you? I had to defend myself as best I could. Um, didn't seem to make much of a difference. You just couldn't control yourself, could you, Miss Heard? I tried to defend myself when I could, um, but it was after years of not defending myself. I accidentally, I swear, when I was trying to close the door, I guess it scraped your toes. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't mean to do that. And then you clock me. I, I remember hitting you as a response to the door thing. You didn't mean to hit me in the head with the door, but you meant to I didn't punch mean. me in the jaw. Okay, I'm sorry I hit you. I did mean to hit you, but it was in, res in response. I just reacted in response to my foot. I just reacted. The cross-examination ending with questions about Heard's ex, Tazia Van Rie, and allegations of abuse in that relationship and an effort to show a pattern of Heard being the aggressor. So Mr. Depp is not the only domestic partner you've assaulted, is he, Ms. Heard? I've never assaulted Mr. Depp or anyone else that I've been romantically linked to, ever. Heard insists that the 2018 Washington Post op-ed she penned labeling herself a public figure representing domestic abuse had nothing to do with Depp. This is about Mr. Depp, isn't it? No, so it's not about May Johnny. It's Ms. about Heard, what happened to me Ms. after. Heard, my... It's that very op-ed that Depp is suing Heard over for $50 million, saying the implications that it was about him were clear despite never naming him claiming it cost the 58-year-old movie roles, despite his insistence he never physically hurt her. 38-year-old Heard countersuing Depp for $100 million for calling her a liar and claiming Depp's team orchestrated an ongoing smear campaign against her. Closing arguments are set for May 27th. Quite the contentious divorce there, or aftermath. Our thanks to Janae for that. In New Jersey, emergency crews swooped in to rescue teens on a beach who became trapped in sand. Authorities say the boy and girl were digging a 10-foot hole when it collapsed. No word on their conditions. As we enter the summer beach season, authorities across the country have been warning about the dangers of digging holes on the beach. And our weather teams are tracking severe storms moving into the Midwest. If you live in Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, and Missouri, all are at risk for possible tornadoes, dangerous winds and hail. This is Texas is recording triple digit heat. It was at least 90 degrees for the 10th straight day in a row in Dallas. That intense heat is expected to move into the northeast by the weekend. Turning now to concerns about gun violence in this country, whether it's in big cities or the mass shootings that are impacting communities of all sizes, this country has not been able to do anything to curb the gun violence. And so we are talking to people on the front lines to discuss what can be done to stop the relentless bloodshed. Philadelphia Police Commissioner Danielle Outlaw joins us now. Commissioner, this primary Tuesday is especially a big one in your state, so we are so grateful that you took the time to talk with us tonight. Let's focus on the issue of gun violence and what we can do about it. What are you seeing in particular in Philadelphia in terms of crime? How much is gun related? A lot of it is gun related. Thank you for even asking that question. We've been saying that a lot of these conflicts have been escalated and have turned into non-fatal shootings or homicides merely because of the fact guns have been introduced into these equations. We've seen younger people being shot. We've seen younger people as our shooters. And because what has become for it, uh, what used to be, uh, you know, as an example, a fight after school has now turned into a shooting because these conflicts, again, has introduced guns. We seized over or close to 6,000 illegal crime guns off the street last year. What in particular do you feel lawmakers need to do in order to address this? Again, it's common sense. Uh, it's something as simple as if your gun is lost or stolen, a law that requires you to report it as lost or stolen would be an easy fix. We are doing everything that we can to work with our local, state, and federal partners, whether it's the ATF, the FBI, uh, to identify where these guns are coming from, and then not just tracing them, but making sure that we connect them to other shootings to get ahead of the next shooter. But there's only so much that we can do with the influx of guns that we're seeing. Of course, the nation's focus has now turned to violence and mental health once again after this weekend's mass shooting in Buffalo. Do you see a connection between the two? And, and what would you like to see done to address the mental health side of things? 
You know what, that's a tricky one. I, I would say the answer is yes, but a lot of what we're seeing goes undiagnosed. So it's, it's pretty easy for us to determine, or usually it's easy for us to determine if someone's experiencing some form of crisis or if there's a developmental disability. But I think with the last two years, with this pandemic, the mental or psychological impacts um, have been tough to measure. And without us having our warm touch points, whether it's in schools, with everything being shut down and folks being so isolated, I think that's one of the things that's driving the numbers that we're seeing, which tells us that our response to gun violence has to be comprehensive. It has to include social services. It has to include uh, housing and ensuring that all of the basic human needs and rights are addressed. And let's go back to policing and the issue in particular of community relations. What are your struggles in Philadelphia? Oh, wow. I, so there's, you know, obviously, whether you're talking about here in Philadelphia or nationwide, there's always been uh, you know, issues, challenges with our relationships. Sometimes I feel like we take 20 steps forward and all it takes is one critical incident, whether it's here in the city or anywhere in the country or in the world, and it takes us 20 years back. So a lot of it has to do with trust building and ensuring that our community trusts us enough to come forward with information, to go to court as a witness to help us solve a lot of these crimes. And then also at the same time, knowing that we're human beings behind the uniform and that we're there to help and that we're there as allies and to be a part of the community as opposed to uh, adversaries. And you talked in particular about people needing to see you as partners and not adversaries. What would you say your vision is for improving the police relations in your community? So now that things are starting to reopen, it's getting back out to meeting people where they are, whether it's in rec centers or our places of worship in the communities to make sure again, that they can see us, not just virtually, uh, but they can get to know who their assigned officers are, assigned to their area, they're not there today, gone tomorrow, getting to know people on a first name basis, knowing where our young people live, ensuring that we maintain a bridge and a connection to our young people, because that's where we really drop the ball. And lastly, as you know, some experts say that the problem is that guns are simply too readily available. Of course, there are others who would disagree. Uh, New York, for example, has strong gun laws, uh, and that did not stop the carnage in Buffalo. Are there any immediate steps that could be taken in order to help keep guns from criminal hands? Yeah, I think there's at least a couple of things, right? So from the from the community standpoint, know what's going on in your house. And I say this because, again, there are more and more young people that are picking up guns for whatever the reason are. Some may think that they have to protect themselves. Some see them being uh, glorified, uh, whether it's video games or whatever it is. And just to say I'm not pushing for censorship, I'm just saying as a parent myself, know what's going on in your home. Uh, the other thing is ensuring that there are consequences. There are far too many people that we've seen um, that are carrying guns illegally and they're committing acts of violent crime. And then at times they may even be committing an act of violent crime or a shooting while they're out of custody after already being arrested. So that's something that I think local commissioners or police chiefs have to continue to work with their local prosecutors or their federal prosecutors to ensure that we are targeting one, the right people. Commissioner Outlaw, we so appreciate your time and insight. Thank you so much for coming My on the pleasure. show. Thank you for having me. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden visiting the scene of that horrific supermarket shooting in Buffalo, where they paid their respects and spoke to the victims' families. How much longer will presidents have to play the role of consoler in chief following a mass shooting before we as a nation say enough is enough? That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us.